Welcome to our uh, seminar part six of our creation seminar. My name is Kent Hovind. I do seminars all over the world on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. So far in this series, we've covered a whole variety of topics like you know, how old is the earth, where do dinosaurs fit in, uh, what about cavemen, the lies in the textbooks, and the effects of the evolution teaching. Tonight we're going to talk about the flood. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? How could the world completely flood? Where does the ice age fit into the Bible? Christians say, if the Bible says the earth is only 6,000 years old, what about the Ice Age? And what froze the mammoths? The big, huge, hairy, hippie elephants that are found frozen are like this mammoth backbone. This is coalified from here from South Florida. Mammoths are found all over the world. We got a mammoth jaw here, a lot of mammoth, is baby mammoth tusk. This is part of one that, from one that was frozen in Siberia, actually in northern, uh, yeah, sub Siberia, northern Russia. What froze the mammoths? How can you freeze an elephant standing up with food still in his teeth? Doesn't it take millions of years to form Grand Canyon? We're going to cover some of those things tonight in the Hoven Theory. And we call it the Hoven Theory because we don't want anybody else to get the blame for it. All right? I have read many books by other people. A book that strongly influenced me many years ago was The Biblical Flood and the Ice Epic, how that uh, Patton thinks that an ice meteor struck the earth or we went through the tail of a comet, one or the other. Anyway, ice got dumped on earth from outer space. This was a good book many years ago. Uh, Don, I mean... Uh, Walt Brown, Ph.D. in physics, uh, Air Force Academy colonel, taught at the Air Force Academy for years, a physics professor, excellent book on uh, the what caused the flood. I differ with Walt Brown on a couple of little minor things. We've talked many times, good friend of mine, highly recommend his work. A few little minor differences, but I think that'd be a good one if you want to get more information to uh, trigger your, to spark your interest on studying this topic. What caused the flood? Is it possible to rain that much to completely cover the world? Where'd all that water go? I mean, if there's a flood, where's the evidence of Noah's flood? Where is all that water? Well, we're going to talk about three things tonight. We're going to talk about the creation a little bit, what we covered on seminar part two. We have to understand what the original creation was like. And then the curse. God put a curse on this world. This world that we're living in today is a junkyard compared to what Adam and Eve lived in. And then the catastrophe. The flood completely wiped out the world. The original creation was very different. I don't think it's possible for us to understand what it used to be like 6,000 years ago when God made the world. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the skeptics I debate at universities say, wait, wait, I don't, I don't believe Genesis. How can we trust Genesis? Who wrote that book? And they'll say there are four different authors. The skeptics will say, they call it the, the J-E-P-D for Yahwist, Elohist, Priestly, and Deuterist. And they'll point out that there are very different styles of writing in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, if you look through Genesis 1, it says, and God said, and God did, and it uses the word God 31 times in chapter 1. When you come to chapter 2, verse 4, and all through chapter 2, it uses the phrase Lord God. It's always Lord God instead of God. It's, it's a totally different style of writing. It's a different name for God. And the skeptics say there are four different authors to Genesis, so we can't trust it. It was written by priests for, you know, political gain or something like that. Well, actually, they're partly right. There are actually... Ten different authors to Genesis, not four. Genesis was written by ten different people, all of them first-hand eyewitness accounts. The Bible says in, in Mark chapter 12, Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham? Here the Bible clearly tells us that Exodus, where it talks the story about the burning bush, is written by Moses. Exodus is the book of Moses. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all written by Moses. But Genesis was only the editor, the collector. He did not actually write Genesis. Moses edited, put it together, probably from ten existing clay tablets. And there's a great footnote in Henry Morris's Defender's Bible, if you get that. And I love Henry Morris, and I sell his Defender's Bible, and I highly recommend it. We do put a disclaimer with it, because a few things I disagree with him. And so, I, you know, so I'm selling it, so I've got a right to disagree if I like. So I think it's, there's a lot of meat here. You have to eat the meat and spit out the bones, is our philosophy. But his footnote here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, is excellent, about the ten, what are called the teledoths the ten different authors of Genesis. The phrase that you can see where the Genesis is divided up is very clear. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says, these are the generations of. Genesis 5, 1 starts off, these are the generations of. Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of. The phrase appears ten different times in Genesis. Ed Moses actually edited it. Probably God wrote Genesis chapter 1, gave it to Adam. Adam wrote a few chapters. Everybody kept adding to this, and by the time you get through the whole creation story, Moses put it all together and put it into one edited form called the book of Genesis. So if you look at uh, the phrase, these are the generations of, in chapter 5, verse 1, it's found in chapter 6, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. That's Noah signing off. Noah actually wrote part of Genesis. The sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth wrote part. 
And you can look through the footnote in Henry Morris's Defender's Bible and see what all the ten times where it uses the phrase, these are the generations of. Terah wrote part of it. Ishmael wrote part of it. As you're reading through Genesis, there's some chapters that look like they're just unrelated. Like who cares about the Dukes of Edom? You know, it's got all these Dukes in there and it looks like the chapter's kind of stuck in the middle. Well, that's a different guy writing. There are ten different people writing this book. So yes, you can trust Genesis. It is all eyewitness accounts. Now it's true that the Babylonian legend was written down before Moses wrote Genesis. I just answered a letter today on our call-in radio show, truthradio.com, on the air live every day from 5 to 6 Central Time. And somebody had called in or written in or emailed us, or AOL Instant Message, I think, you know, about the two different authors in Genesis. I said, well, actually, there's ten different authors of Genesis. And they say, how can you trust it? Well, they're all eyewitnesses. And one, one guy asked, what about the Babylonian account? Didn't Moses copy from the Babylonian story? No. The Babylonians, were, they had finally written down a, an oral legend. See, after the flood, people would talk about the creation and the flood and the Tower of Babel, three major incidents in, in human history. They would talk about that around the campfire for generations. And there are many flood stories and, and creation stories and Tower of Babel stories in cultures all over the world. And the Babylonians wrote theirs down before Moses wrote Genesis. But Moses had the actual clay tablets of the original story. I mean, he had the real McCoy. So what the Babylonians had is an oral tradition that went on for generations and finally got written down. Moses had the original. So no, the, just because Babylonian story was written first does not mean it came first. Moses actually wrote it down from the original story. Anyway, you can read all about that, about the Teledos. But in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. There are people that actually scoff at God's word. How many have ever met one of those before? <laughs> I deal with them all the time. I've had 83 debates now, have four more scheduled in the next two months. Uh, the, the scoffers that scoff at God's word are out there, folks. The woods are full of them. Okay? And it says they're going to walk after their own lust. The reason they scoff is because of their lust, not because of their science. They don't want God telling them what to do. And the scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. The scoffers are dumb on purpose about two things. Number one, about the creation. How God made the heavens by His Word. How the earth was standing in the water and out of the water. We cover all that on video number two. And they're ignorant of the flood. The world was overflowed with water and perished. This world was totally annihilated by a flood. Every inch of ground underwater. So, Christians need to have an answer. How could this happen? Where did the water come from? Where did it go? And where is the evidence of all this? The Bible says the world we have today is kept in store, reserved unto judgment. There's a judgment coming. See, the scoffers don't want to admit there was a creation. They don't want to admit there was a flood. And they don't want to admit there's a judgment coming. That's really what it boils down to. And in our seminar part four, we covered some of the scoffers in the history of this. And in seminar five, some of the effects of this teaching, how it led to the rise of communism, Nazism, socialism, Marxism. You might want to get that videotape. It's very politically incorrect. You may not want to watch that one, actually. But the Bible puts the dates of the creation at about 6,000 years ago or 4,000 B.C. Now, I don't give an exact date, and a plus or minus a few hundred years. And the skeptics will say, well, what did God do for billions of years before the creation? You know, that question assumes that God is stuck in time like we are. See, we are limited by time. We can't go ahead or backwards in time. There have been many times I wished I could go back a few minutes. How many of you had those times before? You wish you could just let me go back two minutes, Lord. Let me, let me try this one more time, okay? Let me miss that tree this time, okay? Uh, uh, but see, God is not limited by time. And the question, what did God do before the creation, assumes there was a before the creation. See, Je God invented time, space, and matter in Genesis 1.1. There was no time before the creation. It's hard for the human brain. It's probably impossible for the human brain to understand that. But the question, what did he do uh, before millions of years, assumes that God has to sit around waiting for a certain time. He's not limited by time. What was before the creation? There was no before. It's a totally different dimension. And someday there will be no, you know, we sing songs like, uh, when we've been there 10,000 years, preach is good, sounds great, but it's not true. We're just going to be there. There will be no time. First thing you do when you get to heaven, take off your watch and fling it over the side. You won't need that anymore. There shall be time and no longer, the angel said. So the, the evolution story starts 20 billion years ago. They start with the beginning also. And even the evolutionists will say there has to be a time when there was no time. 
they think time, space, and matter all came into existence. This textbook says, in the realm of the universe, nothing really means nothing. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. If there were no time, see, you have to have time, space, matter come into existence all simultaneously. If there were matter but were no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You have to have time, space, matter come into existence at the same time. It's called a continuum. There's a great footnote in Henry, Henry Morris's Defender's Bible on that one. I recommend that. That'll make you scratch your head for the rest of your life thinking, man, this is amazing. Our human brain won't wrap around this. Anyway, the Bible says in the beginning, that's time. God created the heaven, that's space, and the ma earth, that's matter. Time, space, matter, all made at the same time. It's called a, uh, the trinity of trinities. Time has three dimensions, past, present, future. Space has three dimensions, length, width, height. And matter has three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. Plasma is just a hotter gas. All three come into existence simultaneously, according to Genesis 1.1. Anyway, Genesis 1 tells us there was a canopy of water above the creation. We mentioned this quite a bit on seminar part two. And before the flood came, the people lived to be over 900. Probably one of the reasons is because of this canopy overhead. And people say, well, wait a minute. The sun, Bible says the sun was made on day four. How did they have light before the sun? Well, God himself is light. The Hebrew word or is the tr word translated light. We have two words in English, two things in English that are both called the same thing. They're both called light. I can look up and say that is a light or I can say turn on the light. That light produces light. In Hebrew they've got two different words. Or is the light itself. Meor is the light source. We, we only have one word in English. In Genesis 1 it says God created the light and then later he made the source for the light. Apparently he started the electromagnetic spectrum. He energized the universe with his voice. He spoke and all the radio waves and uh, microwaves and all the energy waves of the universe, the whole electromagnetic spectrum, the universe was energized just by the voice of God. Um, then he, later he made the lights, the sun, moon, stars, probably so Adam would know not to worship them. I think we got to have a sun. It's a wonderful thing to have, but it's not something to worship. And many cultures worship the sun, so God made it later to show it's, it's important, but it's not the most important. He is the light. The Bible says God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. In Genesis 1.16 it says God made the greater light and the lesser light. This is a different word, the meor, which is the light source. So He made the light before He made the light source. Actually, Psalm 27 says the Lord is my light. He's not the, just the source of our light, He is the light. Fascinating thing to, to study on there. In the Greek it's called phos for phosphorus, where we get our fluorescent light, the root word for uh, fluorescent, which means light. Um, the psalmist said we should consider the heavens, consider the light. The talk, Bible talks about the stars singing together in uh, Job chapter 38. The stars actually produce radio waves. Carl Baugh's got a great theory on that, that he thinks the canopy of water overhead used to translate the vibration of the stars, the radio waves, into sound waves. So Adam and Eve could hear the gospel story proclaimed by the stars. I don't know. Interesting theory. It sure preaches good. Something worth studying if you want to chase another rabbit uh, for a while. That's a neat one to study. But in Revelation 21, it says, They have no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the, God, the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. It's interesting. For the first 13 verses in the Bible, there was light, but no source for the light. God was the light. And at the end of the Bible, there will be no sun, moon, or stars. God is the light. Interesting. Starts off first 13 verses, no sun, moon, stars. Last 17 verses, no sun, moon, stars. It's going to end the same way. We don't need the sun, moon, stars. We have God. He is the light. The Bible says, the Lord God giveth them light. Revelation 22, verse 5. He is the light. Anyway, we can talk all day about the light, but people say, no, if God made a beautiful world, put Adam and Eve in it, made this beautiful garden it talks about, where is the garden? I want to go see it. Where is the Garden of Eden? Well, the flood completely destroyed the world, rearranged the real estate, dropped everybody's property value to zero there for a few months. Uh, I think Noah's Ark, I mean, I think uh, the Garden of Eden is probably long gone, buried under 500 feet of mud someplace. The Bible says in Genesis chapter uh, 2, the Lord God formed a planet, uh, planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. God made this beautiful garden, and it says a river went out of, the, out of Eden, and it parted into four heads, and the name of the one river was Euphrates. And people look at this and say, see, the Garden of Eden must be over in where Baghdad is. How many of you guys are in the military and have been over there to Baghdad? Is there nobody here? We've got several in our church been over there. I would say they would testify that is not the Garden of Eden <laughs> over there. <laughs> uh, far cry. There is a river that runs through Baghdad called e uh, Euphrates. So what? There are 36 cities in America named Greenville. 36 different states have a Greenville. What does that mean? People think it's a neat name, that's all. 
When people got off the ark, they probably saw rivers that reminded them of pre-flood things and said, oh, that looks like, reminds me of, you know, Euphrates, so we'll give it the same name. This Genesis 2.14 tells us the river, one river went out and parted into four heads. I think the water system before the flood came was backwards to today. Today, rivers come together to make bigger rivers. Here, you have one spring coming out of the ground, apparently, parting into four rivers. The water cycle was very different before the flood than it is today. There is a river called Euphrates, runs through Baghdad, that is not the Garden of Eden. It's a pure coincidence. There's a city in Ontario called London. There's a city in America called New York, named after York. They're not the same city. People got off the boat and said, oh, we'll call this, you know, New York. I drove through uh, Missouri and went through the town of Moscow, Missouri. Okay, that is not Moscow, Russia. It's just somebody chose the same name. Garden of Eden is long gone. I don't think we're going to find it. It's probably under 400 feet of mud. I suspect in Pensacola, Florida is my theory on that. Anyway, that world was totally destroyed. How many of you also think it might have been in Pensacola, Florida? Okay, good. You all agree with me then. That's why you live here. The Bible was destroyed by a flood. The Bible teaches that man brought death into the world. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, uh, Romans chapter 5. Man brought death into the world. There was no death until Adam sinned. It was man that brought death into the world. The Bible says death is an enemy. And God made a perfect world where there was no death. Nothing died till Adam sinned. People say, oh, wait a minute. Didn't plants die? Adam ate plants. Doesn't that kill the plant? Well, that, that assumes, of course, that plants are alive. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth the, green, the grass, the herbs, and the fruit trees on the third day. Then it says he, he made all the plants on the third day. If you read Genesis 1, 14 through 19, it says God made the lights in the firmament of the heaven on the fourth day. And then on the fifth day, he made the living things. There's a clear distinction here. Plants made on day three, living things made on day five. Plants are not called alive. That's interesting. Now, in our nomenclature today, plants are considered living. Well, not this one. This is a fake one, but still. Okay. <laughs> we would consider plants alive because that's the way we classify things. But that's not the way they're classified in the Bible. Plants are not considered alive. They're a complex self-replicating food source, but they're not living. I can show you from Scripture here. Genesis 1:24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. This is on day six. He made living creatures. Plants were made on day three. If you read Genesis 1:29, God said in verse 30, to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb. Here there's a clear distinction. All the living things are supposed to eat the green things. He's telling us they're not alive. Now, they're interesting. They grow, they reproduce, but they're not living. And I'll show you why. Genesis chapter 4. Cain brought the fruit of the ground, an offering to the Lord. Abel brought the flock. There's a difference here between the fruit and the flock. You can't get blood out of a turnip. God was not excited about Cain's offering because it didn't have blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, the Bible tells us very clearly. Genesis chapter 6, God said, I bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein there is the breath of life. has to have breath in order to be alive. Genesis 6, 19 says, Every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shall come unto thee, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten. Here's again a distinction. Living things and food are not the same. So the Bible does not consider plants to be alive. Genesis chapter 7, verse 14 says, After the, And the beast and the cattle and the creeping things and the fowl and the birds wherein is the breath of life, in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Genesis chapter 7. And Genesis 9, when they get off the ark, God said, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb. Now, you can, just like you used to eat the plants, now you can eat the moving things. Now you can go shoot Bambi's daddy and eat them. How many do that? Glad to go shoot Bambi's daddy. There you go. Amen. Okay. So there's a clear distinction here between the plants and the living, moving things. Uh, Genesis or Leviticus 17 talks about the life of the flesh is in the blood. Plants don't have blood. Leviticus, Leviticus 17, 13. The, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. And you can't eat that which dieth of itself, according to verse 15. So if it dies of itself, you can't eat it. Well, we wait and eat the nuts and fruit after they fall from the ground, after they fall off the tree. So if they're alive, you'd be violating Scripture to eat them. You couldn't eat anything that came off the tree. You, couldn't eat the, you can't pick the peas and then eat them the next day because it's now off the tree. You know. So no, plants are not alive. The Bible talks about the leaf withering in Psalm chapter 1. It says the grass and, and, and the withers like the green herb in Psalm 37. Isaiah 19 talks about the reeds and the flags shall wither. Isaiah 19 says the reeds shall wither. Isaiah 40 talks about they shall wither. It's not die, it's wither, okay? 
All through Scripture you see where plants, uh, they fade, they wither, but they don't die in the sense that uh, humans or animals die. There's a very different distinction here. Uh, a car can die. That's happened to mine a couple times, actually. A computer can die. How many ever had the blue screen of death come up on your computer, okay? <laughs> and your stuff goes to data heaven, right? There's a lot of stuff in data heaven folks would love to go visit, you know, I'm sure, and get some of that stuff back. A dream can die. The wind can die down. This is not the same kind of death. So, no, plants are not alive. A plant is a complex, self-replicating food source, but it's not alive. I don't know that you could prove insects are alive in the biblical sense either. I don't know that they have the breath of life. They don't breathe through nostrils. They don't breathe. They just absorb oxygen through their skin. So that may be a question. If Adam stepped on an ant, you know, did it die? Well, was it alive? Or are the insects a complex rep self-replicating food source and not alive? I don't know. I haven't solved that one yet. But I think it's something worth looking at. The Garden of Eden was perfect. God made Adam. He was the first man. And people say, wait a minute. What does Adam mean anyway? Who is this Adam guy? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the ten names given from Adam to Noah, fascinating sequence here. Uh, Henry Morris has another great footnote on that one if you want to get it. Uh, but be sure to get my disclaimer with it, a few things we disagree with. Uh, but he's got a great footnote explaining the, name, the meaning of the names. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mah Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down in Hebrew. Uh, Enoch means preaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. And Lamech means the despairing. And Noah means rest. Apparently, just the names from Genesis, from, uh, from Adam to Noah, God is trying to tell us, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down preaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Right in the names, in the Hebrew. And of course, the Hebrew language, they take these things very serious. Not only do the names have meanings, the names have numerical equivalents. And that's another long, interesting story. But anyway, God made this perfect world, and then it got destroyed. Adam sinned, and God cursed it. And he said something very fascinating. I, I read my Bible for years before I caught this. It just jumped out the page at me here one day. Genesis chapter 3. God said to Adam, where art thou? He was out hiding, you know, with his fig leaves on. And the Lord said, hast thou eaten of the tree that I commanded thou shouldest not eat of it? Look what Adam said. The woman that thou gavest to be with me gave me of the tree and I did eat. This is the type of confession you get out of your kids, you know. Adam, did you eat off the tree? Well, Lord, <clears throat> that woman <clears throat> that you gave me, you see I'm trying to pass the buck here? <clears throat> it's mostly her fault and partly your fault, God. I mean, if you hadn't given me that woman, I wouldn't be in this mess. <clears throat> but finally he confesses and says, yeah, I ate it. So he says to the woman, did you do it? She said, the snake, <laughs> implying that you made, <laughs> tricked me. And yeah. I ate. You know, we, all, we confess the same way, don't we? <laughs> Always, it's not completely my fault. Brother, you're in the courts all the time. You see these guys, you know, in the, in the legal profession. Did you do it? Well, not exactly, Your Honor. You know, it's, it's the system's fault, you know, or something else. You get this all the time. Adam did the same thing. It's your fault. It's interesting also in Genesis chapter 3, God talks about the seed of the woman. Now, this is fascinating scripture. You know, for many years, scientists taught that the man's seed was all that was necessary to produce life. They thought the woman just provided the incubation place for the baby to grow. Scientists didn't know that half of the chromosomes came from the woman and half from the man until really in the last hundred years or so, 200, maybe 300 years. God said that in Genesis, the seed of the woman. If it, people just read their Bible, there's a whole lot of cool stuff in there, like the life of the flesh is in the blood. How many folks died in the days when they're bleeding people to get them well, you know? From, just read the book. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, anyway, Genesis chapter 3 says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and conception. Here's part of your curse. You're going to have pain in childbearing, and part of the curse, Adam's going to rule over you. That is actually part of the curse. <laughs> the man's the boss. Because women oftentimes have a very different view of things, and actually sometimes better judgment. But the problem is they're tainted by their uh, emotional, you know, they look at it logically and emotionally. Well, yeah, he committed the crime, but he's such a nice guy, you know, let's let him off, you know. And men are more just <coughs> off with his head, you know. <laughs> so we need that balance, and God puts the two together, and it really gets frustrating sometimes, and sparks fly, you know. And, uh, but still, it's uh, interesting. Okay. God said then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, an amazing verse. He said, Adam, cursed is the ground for thy sake. He said, Adam, you're going to have to work for a living now, and this is good for you. 
It's tragic that so many people don't make their kids work. I, I taught school 15 years, and I saw the kids, you know, that dad would buy them a new car when they turned 16. We had one kid out in the boulevard. We called it the boulevard, East Peoria High School. They're the boulevard boys who get out there and show off their cars. He had one of those super muscle cars back in the uh, you know, early 1970, I think, when I was a junior in high school. And he had, had a switch on where he could shut off the back brakes and only hold the front brakes on and sit there and peel out with his car. And the car wouldn't go anywhere. And smoke and fill the neighborhood. Everybody's really impressed. Wow, look at this guy. He's burning up a whole good set of tires, you know, in five minutes. He's really smart, you know. And then he'd let off the brakes and <laughs> take off down the boulevard. Well, his daddy bought him that new car. My neighbor, his daddy bought him a new, um, oh, one of the really fast Dodges back in those days, 442 or one of those, you know, it was incredible. The kid had put in five transmissions in two years. <laughs> Why? Daddy was buying it. My daddy's philosophy was, I'll buy you guys all the tricycles you need, I'll buy, I'll buy your first two-wheeler, and I'll buy half of your second two-wheeler. And after that, you can have any car you want. As long as you're buying it, that's correct. <laughs> and boy, when I bought my first Volkswagen for $300, you know, I washed it and waxed it and oiled all the hinges. I would go around my car every year and oil every screw, you know, everything that moved. I'd, I'd fix it. I paid for it. And it's just, God said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And I think parents make a tragic mistake of trying to make it easy on their kids. Well, I had it hard. I don't want my kid to have it hard. Look, they need it hard. If you help a chicken out of the egg, it'll die. It's got to peck its way out. It's got to, have, it's got to go through those struggles. And if the kid's moaning and groaning, I've got to walk to school. Yeah. We had to walk to school 40 miles in the snow, barefoot, uphill, both ways. You know? <laughs> I told my kids, hey, life's rough and then you die. Get used to it. Okay? <laughs> That's just the way it's going to be. Okay. Anyway, Genesis said, God said, I'm going to bring, there's going to be thorns and thistles in the sweat of thy brow. You're made out of dust and you're going to return to the dust. Work is actually a blessing. Can you imagine if people that are wicked and vile had nothing to do all day but sit around and think up bad things to do? That's one of the dangers of our welfare system. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. If somebody gets hungry enough, they'll go to work. People that have, you know, problems with addictions and stuff, the work's the best thing for them. I don't have time. i got to work. <laughs> and people that don't have to work for a living almost invariably end up in some kind of trouble. God said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. That curse that he put on this world, still here, folks. We still have pain in childbearing. We still have thorns and thistles. We still got to plow the ground. you got to work. And some of, these, these, some of these politicians grew up with a you know, golden spoon in their mouth or silver spoon in their mouth, you know, never had to work a day in their life. They don't understand what it's all about. Somebody told me politics. Poly means many, and a tick is a blood-sucking insect. Mm. <clears throat> Think about that one. Anyway, after the curse then, there was a flood. The Bible says in Genesis 6, God saw the wickedness of man, and his imaginations of his heart was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man, and grieved him at his heart. And God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. It repented me that I have made them. And the Bible says the earth was corrupt before God and filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way. And God said to Noah, that's it. I'm wiping everybody out. Go build an ark. And Noah said to his boys, boys, go for wood. we got to build a boat. And so they went and got all that go for wood or whatever it was. And then they built this big boat. <clears throat> and we covered about the flood and the ark story <clears throat> a little bit more on videotape number two. A video number three about where is Noah's ark, if there really was a Noah's ark. There are four different options. Watch video two for more on that. I'm sorry, video three, the beginning of seminar part three. Some people have asked, well, hey, if, if, there was, if God was mad at the world, why would he tell Noah to build a big boat? Why not just make everybody die? Can't God say, okay, I want everybody except Noah and his family to die? And they would die. God could do that. Why use a flood anyway? Why make Noah spend, who knows, some people say it took him seven years to build the ark. Some people say 120 years. I don't think the, the scripture is clear on the topic. It took him a long time to build a boat that size. Why do that? Well, interesting. Things to consider about the flood. The flood left evidence. A miracle would not. You can go all over the world and pick up fossils. There are fossils, which are evidence, like this giant trilobite. Something died. This is actually a replica of a fossilized arm to an octopus. Do you realize how unlikely it would be for an octopus to fossilize? They're all soft tissue. Fossilized jellyfish are found. How can that be? Fossilized eggs 
We have three dinos real dinosaur eggs in our museum while they're here today, but they'll be in the museum tomorrow. Dinosaur eggs. Thousands of dinosaur of, and other, many eggs are found fossilized. What's the chances of an egg fossilizing? You know, like slim to none. And yet there's evidence all over the world that we can pick up today. And Satan knows this ought to draw people to say, wow, there was a flood, there was a disaster, this thing was buried quickly. And Satan has used very hard to deceive, he worked very hard to deceive people into thinking that the fossils that testify of God's judgment instead testify of millions of years. Kids go to school for 16 years and they're taught over and over, oh, this is proof for evolution, millions of years. No, this is proof there was a judgment of God. There was a flood. That flood left evidence all over. You can just about any place in the world dig around and find fossils. They're everywhere. Proof of God's judgment. The effects are still here today, but people are misinterpreting that. They're seeing the fossils and understanding, thinking millions of years. No, it ought to be thinking God's judgment. When you look at fossils, I like fossils, and man, I see things have changed. There's a reed that grows to, uh, today. It gets about 15 inches tall, little reed. They find fossils of them that used to be 150 feet tall. Something was very different before the flood. I mean, giant plants lived on this planet. Huge coal fields. Something was different. Plus, the flood, instead of a miracle, gave them warning to repent. They could watch Noah build on that boat every day. They couldn't watch a miracle coming. He could preach, hey, 10 more days, you're all going to drop over. Yeah, right, yeah, right. But they could see that boat going together day after day. It was a constant reminder that they could have gotten saved. And they could have and should have. So, how could a flood cover the whole world? I was debating at University of West Florida, my first debate I ever had, here in Pensacola about 15 years ago. I had a few debates with my wife before that, and I lost those all, so I was not excited about debating this professor, but you know, you're laughing, you know, don't you guys? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I debated this professor, and one of the kids in the audience, we had Q&A time afterwards, he said, Hovind, uh, could it rain enough to cover the earth? He said, you think it really rained enough to cover Mount Everest? He said, don't you know when it rains, the more the heat is released. I said, oh yeah, I understand. I taught physics. It's called the latent heat of uh, condensation. He said, well, heat is released when moisture turns to liquid. And if it rained enough to cover Mount Everest, it would completely cook the world. I said, you're right. He said, but you think it rained enough to cover Mount Everest? I said, no, I never said that. No, you're assuming that Mount Everest was there to begin with, and you're assuming all the water came from rain. You got two very false assumptions in your thinking here. What about this flood? Several theories about the flood. I'm going to give you the Hovind theory of what I think happened to cause that flood. What triggered it? Where did the water come from? Where did it go? And what effects can we see today? Now, we cover much on what the original creation was like on Seminar Part 2. The Bible says there was a canopy of water above the atmosphere and water under the crust of the earth. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. <clears throat> he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 33 says, He layeth up the waters in the, he layeth up the depth in storehouses. The water used to be under the crust of the earth. Psalm 136, He stretched out the earth above the waters. See, when God first made the world, the crust of the earth was stretched over. Most of the water that's now on top was underneath the crust of the earth. There were vast subterranean water chambers. There are still huge amounts of water, huge water chambers down in the earth. The Japanese drilled down, I forget how far, just recently in early 2003, and they said there's probably more water deep in the crust of the earth than there is on the surface of the earth. Just found earlier this year. There's a whole lot of water down there. Well, the Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open. And it says all of them in one day broke open. Here's what I think happened. The earth has cracks all over it. it seems like a baseball. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the uh, San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault, the Ring of Fire. None of them my fault, but there's no question. The earth is all busted up into plates, and the earth has been gone through some really hard times. It's busted up like an eggshell. I think that happened at the time of the flood, not millions of years ago. The Bible says in Job 38, Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? And break for it my decree. He said, He put my decreed place. Your proud waves can't go any farther. There's a beach that stops it from coming up here. But the Bible says the water gushed out of the earth like water out of a womb. I delivered one of my kids at home. If you've never seen a baby get born, you need to see that. One of my friends in college, he was up there getting ready. His wife's going to have a baby. She's standing there fixing breakfast, and her water broke. Whoosh, all over the floor. He came running in to see what's going on, and he slipped and broke his arm. <laughs> she had to drive him to the hospital. <laughs> Set his arm while I have this kid, would you please? 
I mean, the water just gushes out sometimes when they have a baby. And God said the water gushed out of the earth when it broke up. I think the plates of the earth broke apart. The fault lines are still there today from what happened during that flood. And the earth is broken up into plates, and the plates are still moving a little bit, which causes earthquakes, volcanoes. You know, I've studied all that stuff, taught her science for years. People say, wait a minute, isn't that proof of Pangaea? No, that's not proof of Pangaea. Textbooks say all the continents fit together. Well, that's baloney. They don't tell the kids, you know, the truth about this. This textbook says South America and Africa seem to be a perfect fit. That's a pure coincidence, folks, based, folks, based on the water level. Here's the evidence they give to support continental drift. They'll say the shapes of the continent seem to fit. Similar fossils are found on opposite sides of the ocean. Textbook says, see this? Same fossils found in Africa and South America. Well, so what? Those same fossils are actually found all over the world. This is just as much proof of a worldwide flood. How far could the dead animals float in a year? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they point out the two found on opposite sides of the ocean, but they don't point out the same ones are found everywhere. They don't point that out because they're trying to you know, push off a theory on the kids. Uh, this is evidence of a flood, not evidence of Pangaea. And then they say there are magnetic reversals in the ocean floor. No, there are no magnetic reversals. We'll get into that in a second. They don't tell the kids. They shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit. If you cut it out on a, get a, get a globe and cut Africa out, and then cut South America out and compare it to what they did in their textbook. They shrank Africa between 35 and 40 percent. All of Mexico and Central America are gone in the Pangaea maps. Señor, ¿qué pasa? ¿Dónde está Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? Hmm? They don't tell the kids that Europe and South America rotated one way and Africa was rotated a different way. They also don't tell the kids what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. Did you know if you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath? There is. I mean, the oceans actually have a bottom. People say, do you think the continents were connected? I say, what do you mean, were? They still are. It's just the low places are full of water, that's all. <laughs> it's, not like it's, it's not like these are hollow, you know, it's hollow under here and they're floating around like lily pads in a bathtub, you know. The earth has a solid crust, okay? <laughs> I think the Pangaea theory is one of the dumbest theories in the world, but uh, textbooks say there are magnetic reversals. No, there are magnetic reversals. Walt Brown's got a great section in his book about the so-called magnetic reversals, if you want to read more on that or go to his website, creationscience.com, or you can get the book through our ministry. Um, textbooks say these reversals in the magnetic field indicate millions of years of spreading of the ocean floor. Well, I agree the ocean floor is spreading, and I agree the continents are moving, but I don't think it's been millions of years, okay? This is a lie in the textbooks. There aren't really magnetic reversals. There are areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. Here's what happened. They measured the magnetic intensity in the layers of the Earth, at the middle, especially the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and they found some places were stronger magnetically and some places were weaker. Stronger field, weaker field, stronger, weaker. So they drew a, a sine wave. Then somebody drew a line through the middle and called everything below average a reversal. Below average is not reversed. If we line up everybody in the room and find out the average height is five foot seven, does that mean everybody less than five foot seven is reversed down in the ground or are they just less than five foot seven? See, less magnetic intensity does not mean reversed magnetic intensity. There's no place on the ocean floor where a north-seeking compass will point south in relation to the rock. When they drill down, it gets even more jumbled up, as this graph shows from uh, uh, Brian Young's book, uh, Doubts About Creation. I'll definitely get that through our ministry. How much is that, Dan? Do you remember what we sell that for? $11.95. Excellent book on, uh, I think that's correct. You can get our website on uh, about, if you have doubts about creation, read that book. It'll straighten them out. Uh, actually, the magnetic field's getting weaker, which indicates it's, the Earth is less than 25,000 years old. Of course, the evolutionists can't have that, okay? But the magnetic field's decline is really a proof for a young Earth. Walt Brown's theory is excellent on the fault lines and how the, uh, uh, the plates spread about. We'll cover that in a second. Here's Walt Brown's hydroplate theory. We can see on our planet 17 very strange features which can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. This explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains formed. It explains the coal and oil deposits, the rapid continental drift, why on the ocean floor there are huge trenches and hundreds of canyons and volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and most of the fossils, the frozen mammoths, the so-called ice ages, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. 
The pre-flood Earth probably had only one very large supercontinent covered with lush vegetation. There were seas and major rivers. The mountains were smaller than today's, but perhaps 9,000 feet high. According to the hydroplate theory, the pre-flood Earth had a lot of subterranean water, about half of what is now in our oceans. This water was contained in interconnected chambers, forming a thin spherical shell, about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles below the Earth's surface. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water stretched the crust just as a balloon stretches when the, the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack, following the path of least resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the Earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. All along this globe encircling rupture, fountains of water jetted supersonically almost 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rains such as the earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day. And it describes these events about 5,000 years ago, which we can now tie together scientifically. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere froze into supercooled ice crystals and produced some massive ice dumps, burying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals, including the frozen mammoths of Siberia and Alaska. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack, producing huge volumes of sediments that settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. This erosion widened the rupture. Eventually, the width was so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, still with lubricating water beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles per hour, they ran into resistances, compressed and buckled. The portions of the hydroplate that buckled down formed ocean trenches. Those that buckled upward formed mountains. This is why the major mountain chains are parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. The hydroplates in sliding away from the oceanic ridges opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. On the continents, each bowl-shaped depression or basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. The demonstrations you have just witnessed of a massive worldwide catastrophe in antiquity supports the biblical story of the deluge in every detail. All right, that's Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, which I think is excellent. A couple key things he talks about in there is that the canyons had to form quickly as lakes overflowed their boundary. But the other thing is about the mid-Atlantic ridge. What would cause that? This picture here shows that if a spring is compressed and you have two bricks on top of it, as the bricks slide apart, all of a sudden the spring's going to pop up in the center. Apparently, the earth was originally created with a layer of dirt for Adam and Eve to grow their stuff in, and then granite. Granite is amazing rock. There's a place right behind the church here that sells, you know, big slabs of beautiful granite for countertops and stuff, and I got these samples from him. This one's from Brazil. Granite apparently was the original basement rock, and it was not formed by melting rock cooling down. Well, I mean, uh, uh, halos.com, well, uh, Robert Gentry has an excellent book called uh, Creation's Tiny Mystery, which proves granite was never a hot molten mass. It was created instantly, like the Bible says, under water. We covered that on video seven. Under the granite was apparently a layer of water where the subterranean water chambers were, and then a layer of basalt, which is a different kind of rock. The basalt underneath would spring up into the crack as the mid-Atlantic ridge got wider. As these ridge ridges widened, as Walt Brown says, it's gonna spring up. The basalt will bounce up in the center and the plates will slide away. So there was movement of the plates, but that's not proof for Pangaea. Now what happened, as the basalt springs up, it's going to crack, and water's going to fill in the cracks. 
Now today, they're not only full of water, they're full of sediments. It's been 40, 400 years since the flood. The cracks are gone. They're all full of dirt. But when they measured the magnetic intensity, what they're actually finding was where the cracks, where the water rushed in. Because as basalt cools down, it stores a stronger magnetic field. If the basalt is hot, it doesn't store a magnetic field. You can put a magnet in your oven, heat it up, it'll lose its magnetic strength. So it's simply finding the cracks where the earth busted up into plates. That's all they're finding. Get the book if you want. Well, he's got a whole section on that in his book here in the beginning. Hot basalt loses its magnetism and cold basalt stores a strong magnetic field. So that's what they were finding at the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There are no places where a north-seeking compass points south. Now, it is true there is still a little bit of subduction today, as in, you know, plates of the earth are being drawn under. If you ever cook uh, pudding or something, you know, and it develops a skin on it, sometimes the skin on the pudding all of a sudden will just sink to the bottom. And if, if you push it down in one place, it'll draw more down with it, okay? I think some of that is happening or has happened with the crust of the earth. Sections have slid down under. Hawaii, for instance, is over a hot spot, and it appears to be moving. I think there is plate subduction right there. But I don't think it's been going on for millions of years. The other factor that really is confusing for evolutionists is when you look at the bottom of the ocean, there's not much sediment down there. All the dirt washes into the oceans. You'd think the oceans would fill up with dirt. But when they check it out, there's only a few thousand years worth of dirt down there. So why don't the oceans have huge layers of really, really deep sediment? Well, one theory is they're not millions of years old. The other theory is, well, it's being recycled. You know, it's being pulled under. That's why this plate movement theory is so important to the evolutionist. They have actually several serious problems they're trying to overcome. We'll cover in a minute. It's true there seems to be a little bit of plate subduction sliding under other plates. I agree. It's true the earth is busted up. We have fault lines. I agree. That doesn't prove it's been going for millions of years. This plate, the plates are moving, but it doesn't prove time, okay? And there doesn't prove the rate we see today has always been the same. I think Walt Brown's hydroplate theory is excellent. As the water is escaping from underneath, it's going to provide lubrication to slide these things faster. Today, there's very little water left down there. And students, I think, ought to be taught there are other options to this one silly theory. We live right here in Pensacola, Florida. My place is 2.6 miles south of Interstate 10 off Highway 29. If I go up to the interstate and stand there and I watch somebody headed east toward Jacksonville, does that prove he started in Los Angeles four days ago? No, they might have just got on at the next exit down there, right? The fact that we see the plates moving does not prove anything as far as time. Here's the flaw in their logic. They look at the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean spreading about three centimeters a year, about an inch, a little over an inch a year it is spreading. And they'll say, see, Look at the distance across there. It's so many thousand miles and one inch a year. That proves, you know, blah, 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 millions of years. <laughs> that proves you can, you're making some assumptions in your calculations. That's all that proves, okay? <laughs> Plus, they're forgetting the continental shelf and forgetting the shapes of the continents is just a pure coincidence. If you raise the water 600 feet, you know, from here to the highway, Chicago is underwater. The ocean's average 12,000 feet deep. Just a 600-foot change would put Chicago underwater. We'll show more on that in the second session here. Continental drift theory in the textbooks is trying to avoid two embarrassing problems. Number one, the magnetic field's getting weaker, saying the Earth is young, and there's not much dirt in the bottom of the ocean, saying the Earth is young. Those are two evidences of young Earth that they're trying desperately to avoid with their continental drift theory. Okay, so what about the Ice Age? Is it true that the Earth was covered with ice? Well, maybe not the whole Earth, but there was ice all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri. I was just up in... Uh, I've just been everywhere. I was in British Columbia the day before yesterday. Uh, Some place where they have these large terminal moraines and drumlins, big, huge piles of rocks. You know, as I studied this for years in earth science, it's fascinating to see ice, when it, leaves, when it melts back, leaves behind a pile of rocks. When I was in uh, Washington uh, climbing Mount Rainier, my sister lives out there, they had a picture of this huge pile of rocks and somebody standing on top of it in front of this big glacier. They're going to get their picture taken. You know, the man's up there standing on this massive pile of big boulders, you know, and he's smiling, not realizing, you know why that pile of boulders is there? They're coming off the top of that glacier. So his wife takes the picture just as one about the size of a basketball falls down just behind his head from about 130 feet up. If that would hit him on the head, he'd have to open his shirt to eat the rest of his life, man. <laughs> Glaciers leave behind piles of rocks when they melt back. If it's on the side, it's called a lateral moraine. If it's in front, it's called a terminal moraine. But there's no question there is obvious evidence the Earth had an ice age. 
all over Ohio and Indiana, on a famous uh, drumlin where ice carved around a hill, is Bunker's Hill or Breed's Hill where the Revolutionary War started. That's, a, that's formed by ice. There's no question there was an ice age, but the question is, where does it fit into the Bible? And was it really millions of years ago? As these glaciers plow ahead, they leave behind all these rocks and they melt back and the rocks stay there. And all over places in Illinois and Ohio, you see these piles. If you dig down in, you hit big boulders. And they're usually rounded, smooth boulders. So what caused the Ice Age? We're going to cover that in the Hovind Theory. And what froze the mammoths? Those big, hairy, hippie elephants that are found frozen, standing up sometimes, food still in their mouth. The Beresovka mammoth, found 1901, was a famous one. Uh, part of the trunk, had front, and trunk and front foot had been eaten by wolves, apparently. But the rest of it was still frozen in the ground. They dug it out, put it in, it's in a museum in Russia. How do you freeze an elephant standing up? And it's not just one, I mean many thousands. In one year, they removed 20,000 pairs of tusks. One year. It's called uh, fossil ivory. This is one right here, a small one from a baby one. I've got a friend in Alaska that goes over to Siberia and he buys uh, and trades in fossil ivory, he carves things out of it. Amazing, beautiful little carvings out of you know, ancient ivory that was frozen. Well, how do you freeze an elephant? It's not just one. Walt Brown's got a page, page in his book here about the map showing where all the different frozen uh, mammoth and frozen rhinoceros are found, frozen camels near the North Pole, frozen bobcat. What happened? How do you explain this from a biblical worldview? Well, some of the mammoths are frozen standing up, not all of them. So they have undigested food still in their stomach and still in their teeth. They didn't even swallow their last bite. They died of suffocation. There's no water found in the lungs. And the small ice crystals in the blood indicate they probably froze in less than five hours. How do you freeze an elephant in less than five hours? I got curious about this, so I called bird's eye frozen food people in New York. <laughs> I called physics professors, I called meat packers, I called everybody I could think of, a butchers that might have an answer. And I said, how on earth would you freeze an elephant? I said, I called them, when I called bird's eyes, talked to one of the scientists there, I said, if I stuck an elephant in the freezer, what would happen? It was silence on the other end of the line. <laughs> he said, he said, you'd have a crowded freezer. I said, well, yeah, I know that. But uh, I said, how, how long would it take to freeze an elephant? He said, well, normal freezers are about, you know, 10, 10 below, maybe five, 10 above, uh, zero. Probably take about five hours to freeze an elephant. I said, well, that, that's not going to work. I've got to freeze my elephant. And, you know, he said, he said, probably take about five days. I'm sorry. He said, take about five days to freeze an elephant. I said, that's not going to work because the food in the stomach is going to rot in five days. You know, the acid's still working. It doesn't know he's dead. All it knows is it's acid. It's supposed to break this stuff down. I said, I need to freeze my elephant in five hours. They said, well, then you're going to have to find something 300 below zero, like liquid nitrogen. Well, it never gets 300 below zero on Earth, the coldest it has ever gotten. Here's a map from National Pornographic, a geographic. <laughs> they said the coldest temperature on Earth is minus 127. That's pretty chilly. I was up in Barrow, Alaska a few months ago where it gets to 80 below zero. That's chilly. But that's still not cold enough to freeze the mammoths. What happened? I talked to a guy when I was up in Alaska. He said, oh, yeah. Uh, he told me he works in the oil field drilling for oil near Barrow. He said they drill down 1,000 feet through permanently frozen ground, permafrost, and hit trees. He said one day they were drilling and hit a tree, and they always take whatever they drill out and lay it on the ground beside them to go, you know, de develop a, a sample of what's down in the ground. He said they drilled straight through the top of a tree that was 300 feet tall, standing up. This is on the north slope of Alaska. Folks, I was just up there. There are no trees. We saw one tree growing in a Chinese restaurant inside, you know, about this big. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. There are no trees in Barrow, Alaska. There are certainly no trees 300 feet tall. There are very few trees in the world 300 feet tall. You know, some of the redwoods are that size. But how do you get 300-foot tree standing up under 1,000 feet of permanently frozen ground? What happened? Well, I'm going to give the Hovind theory of what I think caused the flood in the days of Noah. We're going to give this in the next session mostly. I'll just give you a few things to consider. Now, many people have contributed to this. I'll take the blame for it if it's wrong. It's just a theory. Some people say, I think your theory is wrong about this little point. Okay, then modify the theory. That's what it's for. It's to give you a skeleton to hang the meat on, okay? I'm going to, we're going to review a little science and then give you the Hovind theory. There's a law called the inverse square law. 
which says if two objects are attracted to each other, like the Earth and the Moon have gravity pulling them together, or two magnets, the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In English, that means if you brought it into one half the distance, it would quadruple the attraction, not double it. Inverse square laws apply when you're dealing with forces involving gravity, light, magnetism, and girls. <laughs> See, when you half the distance, the attraction is quadrupled, not doubled. Many guys don't understand that. See, I travel every week. I've been home seven Sundays in the last 14 years, which means I get to come home every week. I get 10 feet away from my wife, and it's, hello, dear, how are you doing? You know, when you get five feet away, it's four times the attraction, not two. When you get real close, it's just too late, okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> Overpowers all resistance at that distance. So stay 10 feet away, guys. Your problems will be solved. Anyway, next thing you need to consider, when a top is spinning, it behaves in a very peculiar way. If a spinning object is struck by something, like a gyroscope, if you bump it, it'll wobble for a while and then recover spinning, but it'll be spinning at a strange angle. Spinning tops follow actually a very predictable pattern when they're struck by something, like gyroscopes or with the bicycle wheels full of water that we have at Dinosaur Adventure Land. Come over there and tie our thing with our bicycle wheels. That You get them spinning and it's very hard to change the spin, but they follow a predictable path. You can actually determine when it was struck <coughs> by tracing back the wobbling pattern and say, oh, it must have got hit right here, okay? The Earth obviously has had different no north poles. The Earth, the spin, the tell you the Earth, they build your globes, you know, it's tilted over 23 and a half degrees. Oh, it spins this way, actually. But uh, it's tilted 23 and a half degrees. It wasn't always that tilt. There's quite a bit of evidence on this planet that the Earth had different tilts. Stonehenge, for instance, probably was built at a time with, to worship the sun or study the sun, but the Earth had a different tilt when Stonehenge was built. Same with Edexus and Amun-Ra. George Dodwell was the Australian, the government astronomer for Australia for years, back from 1909 to 1950-something. He was the main astronomer for the government of Australia. He spent years studying the tilt of the Earth in, from historical data. He says the Earth was tilted differently down through time. He made a graph of the tilt of the Earth when it, the Earth is moving. He said the, the, change, the Earth uh, angle of uh, declination in relation to its orbit around the sun is changing. He said after studying all this, it looked to him like something struck the earth 4,350 years ago and made the earth wobble for several thousand years. And now it's pretty stable. The North Pole's still moving a little bit, but basically it's pretty stable. But did something strike the earth 4,350 years ago? Well, that's about the time of the biblical flood, you know. What happened? Today we're tilted over, and that's what causes the seasons. Talks, the Bible talks about summer and winter. The first mention of cold weather is after the flood, Genesis chapter 8. I know there were seasons before. There was no, apparently no cold weather before. So keep that thought in mind. Third thing, some of the planets have craters on them. The moon obviously has craters all over the place. Mercury has craters. Many of these, uh, Mars has craters. What happened? What caused the craters on these planets? Mars has a canyon bigger than Grand Canyon, and there's not a drop of water to be found to be proven on Mars. And there's a canyon bigger than Grand Canyon. And this article says it was carved in an instant, almost instant Grand Canyon when a uh, lake overflowed. Now why can they look at a canyon on Mars and determine it was formed very quickly? And they can't look at Grand Canyon on Earth and can't determine that was formed very quickly. Here you got plenty of water on Earth, almost no water on Mars. What's their logic here? And we talk all about it in this article here. You can read for yourself about the canyon on Mars forming very quickly as a, a lake overflowed. I agree. I think many canyons form quickly. There's an effect in, in physics called the Meissner effect. A magnet will actually float on top of another magnet. If you put two north poles together, one will float on top of the other. Japanese use this for their high-speed maglev trains. Uh, the Meissner effect. The, all this is going to tie in what we call the Hoban theory, but you need to have a little refresher in science here. What caused all this? There are comets flying around through space, but these comets are extremely cold, like three to 400 below zero. Don't lick them. How many of you have a piece of your tongue stuck to a pipe or a pump handle someplace in the world right now because when you were a kid, you were as dumb as me? Okay. <laughs> My brother said, I bet you can't lick that pole. I bet I can. <laughs> Ten below zero in Illinois, you know. Um, super cold things exist in space, cold enough to freeze the mammoths. Next week, we're going to cover some more of the Hoban theory of what caused the freezing of the mammoths, the Ice Age, and the flood, and Grand Canyon, and all that. So tune in again next time. See you then.
Well, welcome, folks, to the Creation Seminar Part 6. This will be a continuation of what we covered last time on uh, the Hovind Theory, what caused the flood. But before we go into my theory of what caused all this, we have to review a little bit of science. When we started last time talking about some of the things about science that you need to be refreshed about, the Meisner effect, and about super cold comets in space. Some of the comets, most of the comets out there in space are extremely cold, like three to 400 below zero. Now, next thing you need to keep in mind, if you throw a snowball too fast, it'll break apart. I know here we are in Florida, probably some of you have never seen a snowball before, but it's the white stuff, you know, that falls out of the sky. You know, not, not the pigeons, but uh, the, if you throw snow too fast, it will break apart in space. You can't throw a snow, you couldn't shoot a snowball out of a cannon, it would break apart. It wouldn't hold together in one piece. So if a comet was going too fast, it would break apart. We saw that when the comet got sucked into Jupiter, Comet Shoemaker several years ago. They saw the comet headed toward Jupiter. It kept going faster and faster because gravity gets stronger the closer you get, the inverse square law. And as the comet got up to a certain speed, all of a sudden, poof, it just blew apart in space. There were 27 pieces that we could see from here that hit Jupiter. Who knows how many millions there actually were. But it broke up into thousands, at least thousands, probably millions of pieces. So comets are flying through space, but they have a maximum velocity or they will simply break apart. Next thing to keep in mind, the Earth has a very strong magnetic field, but the magnetic field is getting weaker. Which means back at the time of the flood, the magnetic field probably maybe even eight or ten times stronger than it is today this magnetic field protecting the Earth. And next thing to keep in mind, super cold particles sometimes are easily magnetically deflected or statically charged. For instance, we have the northern lights. How many have ever got to see the northern lights? I've only been able to see them twice, uh, once in uh, South Dakota and once in Canada. I had to get to an airport, three hour drive to get to the plane, I had to catch the plane at seven in the morning. So at three in the morning, we left from the seminar to drive. So I laid in the back seat and looked out the window, and the northern lights were just going crazy that night. As three hours, got to watch them. It's unbelievable. If you've never seen them, they're phenomenal. You guys seen them in South Dakota? You live there. You don't get to. See, you got to go up at night to see them. Okay. Well, they don't. Not out in the daytime. Oh, they're out in the daytime, but you can't see them. The northern lights are caused by the phenomena of the particles being or energy being deflected to the north and south pole from the Earth's magnetic field. I think the same thing could happen with super cold ice particles. Little fragments could be deflected to the north and south pole. Next thing to keep in mind, the pre-flood world was a lot different. They had a canopy of water or ice to protect them. We covered that in seminar part two. And next thing to keep in mind, before we give you the Hovind theory, who on earth is Peleg? There's a guy in the Bible named Peleg. If you read through Genesis chapter 10, it's kind of a boring chapter. I hate to say that, but it's kind of boring. You know, it's all them names that nobody can pronounce but Alexander Scorby. And you come to Genesis 10, 25, and it says, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. All the rest of these guys in Genesis 10, it doesn't tell us anything about them. It says their name and his son's name and his son's name and his son's name. And all of a sudden it says, in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And then it says his brother's name was Joktan. Well, nobody else gets their brother mentioned. Why would Peleg get his brother mentioned? Well, Joktan in Hebrew means shortening and Peleg means divided. So who on earth is this Peleg? If you get the seminar notebook, the last page folds out to be this timeline. You can see Peleg on there a couple of generations after the flood. Who was Peleg? Notice Peleg's daddy lived over 400 years. Peleg only lived 239. What happened? We'll cover that in a minute. Next thing to keep in mind, the pre-flood world had a canopy of water overhead and a layer of water under the crust of the earth. Mentioned in Psalm 33, Psalm 136, uh, Psalm 24. This water used to be under the crust of the earth. Next thing to keep in mind, sometimes there are two ways to look at things. If you remember our seminar part four, you know, how fast was that calf going? Anyway, two ways to look at things in this world. So I made a conscious decision 35 years ago as a brand new Christian. I, I had kids in school making fun of me for being a Christian and telling me the Bible's got contradictions and blah, blah, blah. I went through all the typical persecution of a young Christian. And I had to decide I'm going to believe the Bible until it is proven wrong. Some people have decided they are not going to believe the Bible until it's proven right. I think that's a mistake. One atheist came to the preacher one day and said, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe anything in the Bible. I believe science. He said, if you can prove one verse out of the Bible scientifically, I'll believe it. The preacher said, okay. He grabbed the atheist around the neck, grabbed his nose, and began twisting his nose back and forth till the blood started coming out. The atheist said, man, what are you doing? He said, well, the Bible says the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. I was just proving it to you, you know. <laughs> I don't recommend you do that, but it is in there, folks, okay? Anyway, here's the Hovind theory. What I'm going to do is supposed to be a good teaching technique. I don't know if it works or not, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. 
So we'll go through this real fast, real slow, and then real fast at the end to kind of give a conclusion of what caused the flood, what froze the mammoths, why is the earth tilted, why do we have seasons, what froze the mammoths standing up. Eight points to the Hovind theory, very simple. I think Noah and the animals got safely into the ark, number one. Number two, a 300 degree below zero Fahrenheit ice meteor came flying through space. As it got closer to some of the planets, it broke apart. And some of the fragments made the rings. Some of the planets have rings around them. Why do Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have rings, rings made of ice? What happened? As it got close to the Earth, some of the fragments would tend to be sucked into the north and south pole. And so the Earth got snowed on with extremely cold, like 300 or 400 below zero snow, mostly around the poles. Now, a lot of it would vaporize, I know, coming through the atmosphere. But just like you can spray a hose right through the middle of a fire, some of it will make it out the other side. If you get enough going in the same direction, it will develop a cold channel right through the middle of a hot fire. Super cold ice could dump in on the earth and make a cold channel right through a warm atmosphere. If you get enough of it going at the same time, coming fast enough. Then the fourth thing that happened, this dump of ice on the north and south pole caused the earth to crack, releasing the fountains of the deep, caused the earth to wobble from the extra weight on the north and south pole, and the rapidly spreading ice, you keep dumping ice in one spot, it's going to spread out and went sliding across the countryside, carving the glacier effects that we still see today. It caused the burial of the mammoths. They're frozen, standing up, food in their stomach, and they suffocated. It caused the earth to wobble for a few thousand years. It made the canopy that used to protect the earth collapse, because when warm air hits cold air, it rains. And it opened up the fountains of the deep, and the water came shooting out from inside the crust of the earth, like the uh, Walt Brown's hydroplate theory shows. Then, during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals settled out and were buried. And plants were buried by the bazillions. And the big piles of plants became coal, and animals turned into oil, natural gas, or fossils, depending on how they're buried and how deep they're buried and what conditions they're buried in. That became the coal and the fossil graveyards over the next few hundred years. Then during the last part of the flood, the unstable plates of the earth would crack and shift and move around. Some places lift up, other places sink down. Water's going to fill in the low place. If we filled this room full of water, lifted up one end of the room, the water would rush down to the low end. I think the plates of the earth tilted and water ran off, forming the mountain ranges, the canyons, and the um, trenches. We'll cover that in a minute. As the ocean thin spots sank down, they became the oceans. Other spots lifted up, they became the continents. And the runoff caused enormous erosion. Grand Canyon probably formed in a couple of weeks. Over the next few hundred years, the ice caps would slowly melt back. This is going to raise the ocean levels slowly. That's the only thing to explain the continental shelf. Why do we have a continental shelf out there? That explains the shortening of the lives in the days of Peleg, from CO2 being absorbed by the water. And we can still see today the devastating effects of this flood. So that's the Hovind theory in a nutshell. Let's go over through a little more detail now. God made a perfect world. Man wrecked it with his sin. God said, I'm going to destroy it. Noah built a boat. Noah said, God said to Noah, get in with all the critters. God said to Noah, Come thou, Genesis chapter 7. That is a good sermon right there. God didn't tell Noah to go into the ark. He told him to come into the ark. Where does God have to be in order to say that? In the ark. <laughs> That's, that'll preach. Later he said, go out of the ark. He didn't say come out of the ark. God was in there with him the whole time. I don't mind taking a one-year cruise with all the critters on board if God's in there with me. Okay, <laughs> So <laughs> that'll preach. And then the Bible says the Lord shut him in, Genesis 7, verse 16. If God shuts the door, it won't leak. Good eternal security verse. If you're in Christ, you're safe, okay? People say, you think you can lose your salvation? Absolutely not. Are you kidding? I didn't deserve it before I got it. I didn't deserve it while I was getting it. I don't deserve it now. If I could lose it, I never would have it. <laughs> Nobody would have it, okay? I'm sealed in Christ, not sealed because of what I did. It's because of what he did. So then I think what happened, Noah's in there safe and sound. A 300 degree below zero ice meteor comes flying through space and starts to crack up in space. Some of the fragments become rings around the planets. Some of them make craters. You know, a chunk of ice would hit a planet, make a crater, and then later vaporize and disappear, leaving behind the hole, but no evidence of what hit it. Ice would do that, okay? Some planets have rings around them. At least four planets have these ice rings. And they're made of not only ice, but also rock and ice. Now, Walt Brown thinks that the, ice, the rings around the planets came from Earth. He thinks the fountains of the deep broke open and shot stuff up into space. He thinks the comets flying around through space came from Earth. 
good theory. I don't know if you could prove that or not, but it's have to go pretty fast to get away from Earth's gravity, you know. But uh, you get supersonic stuff shooting out of the out of the ground from the, you know rocks blasting up from the fountains of the deep. It's a good theory. Could be true. I don't know. But these comets flying around through space are certainly super cold ice. As this sections of the comet, or maybe the tail of the comet, got close to the Earth, it would be sucked in because of the Earth's magnetic field. It would be deflected mostly to the north and south poles. So the Earth got hit mostly around the poles. Some fragments might make it through, the big ones might make it through, and actually leave behind craters that after the flood would still be visible. Maybe eroded some from the flood, but there could be craters. I don't know if the Yucatan Peninsula crater is an example of that, but there could be craters, or the big one in Quebec, Canada, uh, 47 miles across. Something huge hit Quebec, left a 47-mile crater. Um, that could be from this ice, I don't know. But also, super cold ice is easily statically charged. We have a Van de Graaff generator at our place, so you can go over there and stick your hand on there and poof, make your hair stand up. You've all seen those before, right, in physics class. A lot of fun. Come on over and you can try ours. Well, here's my theory. I think a super cold ice meteor came toward the Earth, broke apart. Most of the fragments landed on the poles. This caused the Earth to wobble, cracked the crust, released the fountains of the deep. The canopy overhead then would collapse because super cold air coming off of this ice cap. Just like when you open the freezer, you can see the cold air flow out. Well, cold air is like we get the Canadian winds come down, you know, and from Canada and freeze the people down in Texas primarily. Uh, there are cold fronts that move off of big masses of, of cold ground. That would happen at the time of the flood and for the next few hundred years, actually, from this ice cap sending off these cold waves. It's still coming today, actually. Uh, scientists just discovered here a few years ago there are still massive amounts of ice hitting the Earth all the time. Earth gets clobbered by big chunks of ice as big as a house. It melts in space and ends up coming down just as moisture, but we're getting a lot of ice and water added to the Earth from this, from this phenomenon. I think this is remnant ice floating around from 4,400 years ago at the time of the flood. This article talks about water, water everywhere in space, finding lots of chunks of water, you know, amounts of water and chunks of ice in outer space. Now, when they went, this, this map shows the North Pole kind of from a strange view. It shows Greenland down at the bottom uh, lower right and uh, Russia to the upper left, but it shows what the North Sea would look like without the water in it. There's an island up there, up at uh, 10 o'clock on your map, called the New Siberian Islands. There on those, new, on those New Siberian Islands, they find frozen bobcat, frozen camels, frozen bison, frozen mammoths. What's a camel doing up near the North Pole? And some of these camels are 15 feet tall. I mean, a really big camel. What happened? How do you freeze animals up near the North Pole? And why were they there? Well, I think before the flood came, the world probably had very, very small ice caps, if any, because it wasn't tilted as much as it is today. If the Earth were not tilted quite so much, we'd have almost, you know, springtime all the time. There still would be probably small polar ice caps just because of the angle of the sun. It'd probably be colder weather at the north and warmer at the equator, but nothing like it is today. When they drill down through the ice, sometimes they find strange things. Like in Antarctica, they drill down, which is at the bottom of the world here. Well, we call it the bottom. Of course, you can't tell when you're standing there, but at the south end of the world, they drill down through the ice and hit coal. There's enormous evidence of huge forests in Antarctica where there's not one tree growing today. There's not a blade of grass growing down there. Admiral Byrd said he found frozen palm leaves under the ice near the South Pole. Here's an article telling about 400 miles from the South Pole, they find dinosaur footprints and dinosaurs, huh? And thousands of well-preserved leaves found in Antarctica. What happened? 250 miles from the South Pole, they find frozen leaves in the side of a cliff. There are no trees there, none, zero. This article talks about the discovery of these leaves. They have their original cellular content. These leaves are not fossilized. They're still leaves. Up in Alaska, they found dinosaur bones and dinosaur tracks in Alaska. It's cold in Alaska. Actually, there's a good book uh, by some guys who went up to northern Alaska and found frozen dinosaur bones, not even fossilized, called The Great Alaska Dinosaur Adventure, a Great Alaskan Adventure or something like that. We can get it through our bookstore. But uh, frozen dinosaur bones, not even, not even fossilized? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> we cover more on that in video number seven. The Earth actually has two North Poles. We have what's called the geographic North Pole. We spin around that one. And we have a magnetic North Pole up here in Canada. Your compass points to the magnetic North Pole. 
Now here in Florida, it doesn't affect us because we're pretty much straight line. But if you live in Alaska, there's quite a difference. Pilots have to really watch for this angle of declination uh, because the North Pole is not really the North Pole. And they have to allow how many degrees to, to change their navigation based upon, you know, because it's pointing magnetic north, not geographic north. It appears that the Ice Age, you can look at the map here, it appears that the Ice Age is centered around the magnetic North Pole. There was more ice in America than there was in Russia, for instance. The Ice Age effects came down further. Here's what I think happened. The mammoths were up there chomping on their tropical flowers, enjoying a wonderful meal, and all of a sudden it began to snow. They had never seen snow before. So one of them said, Herman, this is peculiar weather we got going on here. Let's get out of here. They started running around, and the snow got deeper and deeper, and pretty soon they ended up in snow so deep they couldn't even fall over. How many of you have ever been in snow so deep you couldn't fall down? You don't get that in Florida much, but you guys do in South Dakota, don't you? And the mammoths ended up standing up, suffocating in 300 below zero, super cold snow. They froze in five hours under those conditions. Because a large chunk of meat takes a long time to freeze. You ladies know if you freeze or thaw a large turkey or something, it takes 24 hours to freeze or thaw 12 inches. Well, the mammoths are found frozen so quickly the food in their stomach is still green, still recognizable. It didn't keep digesting after they died. As the ice would go spreading out across the countryside, it would leave behind scratches in the rock like you see in Kelly's Island, Ohio, or all across Indiana or Illinois. There are glacial grooves. Yes, there actually was an ice age, but it wasn't millions of years ago. I think it was triggered at the time of the flood. There are basically two theories about the ice age among creationists. One theory says the flood caused the ice age. My theory says the ice age caused the flood. Very similar. I think the ice age started, actually caused the flood to start. I don't think you're going to explain five million mammoths perishing at one time if the ice age came after the flood because mammoths are a little slow reproducing. You know, it takes a couple years to have a baby mammoth, okay? And to get five million of them is going to take a long time. So I think the ice age had to come in, in and triggered the flood. Then the ice would still last for a few hundred years afterwards, but probably that was the trigger. So the earth had these big cold spots. Cold air hits warm air, causes it to rain. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. The canopy that used to protect the earth collapsed and everybody drowned. The Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open. I think because of the impact, or maybe because of the weight of the, of the earth, or the changing in the tilt, or just the near miss of a comet, just a, something going by, the gravitational tug would flex the crust of the earth, causing it to crack. Several things could have happened, releasing the fountains of the deep. If you get the book of Jasher, we sell it in our uh, bookstore. I don't know that this is the one mentioned in the Bible, okay? There's a book of Jasher and a book of Enoch mentioned in the Bible. There are some floating around in circulation. Neither may be legitimate. It appears the book of Enoch is actually a forgery by one of the cults uh, who wanted to document, wanted to, to say, well, the Bible says right here, you know, certain doctrines, things that they teach. So they wrote their own book of Enoch, knowing nobody had ever found the book of Enoch. Book of Jasher may be that way too, I don't know. But it says in Jasher chapter 6, On that day the Lord caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the earth raged, and the whole earth was moved violently. <clears throat> And the lightning flashed and the thunder roared and all the foundations of the earth were broken up. Fascinating book to read. If you want to get the book of Jasher, it's like 10 bucks in our bookstore. But uh, I think this is another description of what happened at the time of the flood. The earth actually broke apart. Something caused it. Walt Brown says the earth was stretched, you know, over the water. I agree, but he doesn't have a mechanism. And I talked to him about it. I said, what caused the earth to crack? He said, I don't know. It just did. Well, maybe so. But I think, you know, outer space meteor strike is one possible solution to that. So, this dump of ice on the poles caused the earth to crack. That released the fountains of the deep. The rapidly spreading ice caused the ice age effects. It caused the burial of the mammoths. It made the earth wobble for a few thousand years. And it made the pre-flood canopy collapse. It rained 40 days and 40 nights and the earth was completely covered by water. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. This is not a local flood. When I debated Hugh Ross on the John Ankerberg show for three hours, you know, I said, Dr. Ross, do you believe in a universal flood? No, I said, do you believe in a worldwide flood? He said, I believe in a universal flood. Now, I know what he really believes, and I thought that was a deceitful answer. I said, what do you mean a universal flood? He said, well, it flooded Noah's little universe, which was the valley that he lived in. There was no reason to flood the whole world, he says, because, you know, why kill the penguins? They didn't do anything wrong. Well, that sounds good, but it's not scriptural, okay? The Bible says the hills were covered. The whole mountains were covered. If you shrank the earth down to the size of this 12-inch globe, all the water in the oceans would not even fill a tablespoon. 
at this scale. I mean, I flew back over to Pacific. I told one of the guys in my office, I said, man, the Pacific Ocean is huge. And he said, oh, that's just the top of it. <laughs> that's quite a thought. But even though these, there's huge amounts of water on this planet, when you shrink it down to this scale, it won't even fill a tablespoon. Three miles of water spread over the uh, world is thinner than the paper on this globe at this scale. This is 8,000 miles across the Earth. Three miles compared to 8,000 is nothing. And if you smoothed out the Earth right now, if you just smoothed it out, push the mountains down, lift the oceans up, level everything out, there's enough water out there right now to cover the Earth a mile and a half deep everywhere. People say, where'd all the water from the flood go? Oh, it's still here. It's gathered into big puddles called oceans. The water's still here from that flood. And the Pacific Ocean is gigantic, and that's just one of the oceans, okay? When they climbed Mount Everest in 1953, they began to find something strange up near the top of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain that we know of in the world. They began to find petrified clams in the closed position. Petrified clams on top of Mount Everest. Up in Peru, two miles above sea level recently, they found giant oysters 11 and a half feet wide, weighing 600 pounds. Petrified oysters in the closed position. Now you can walk along the beach here in Pensacola and find a billion seashells. You hardly ever find a matched pair, and you never find them closed if they're dead. As soon as they die, they open. How do you get petrified clams in the closed position on top of Mount Everest? Well, Your Honor, I'd like to argue, first of all, that Mount Everest is a little ways from the beach. Okay, right there. Number two, clams don't climb mountains very well. Number three, when a clam dies, it opens. So how can we explain petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest? One atheist I debated said, do you think the water covered Mount Everest? I said, well, Mount Everest was underwater, but Mount Everest wasn't there. The mountains actually arose during the last part of the flood. Sometimes they find petrified clams in beds up to 10 feet thick. Solid petrified clams, 10 feet. A guy in Alabama, I spoke up there in his church in central Alabama, he said, hey, you want some more petrified clams? I said, yeah. Why? He said, they're four feet thick in my backyard. Every time I rode or till my garden, I bring up thousands of petrified clams, closed. I got a bunch of them here, little tiny ones. Petrified clams in the closed position. I think that's evidence they were buried alive in mudslides, which would happen during the flood, and they woke up dead and couldn't open. And ended up petrified. It doesn't take long for things to petrify. Petrified eggs are found, like this picture here shows. We've got three dinosaur eggs on the table. You can come see. Those are real petrified dinosaur eggs. Petrified jellyfish. Petrified octopus arm. Soft-bodied creatures just don't petrify today. They get eaten by somebody. Even animals don't petrify in the jungle of Africa. They get scattered all over the place. You know, the bones are dragged around, and even the bones get chewed up. What happened? Well, the Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open. I think the earth got hit. It wobbled for a while, and it cracked apart. And the water underneath that used to be there, mentioned in Psalm 136 and Psalm 24, came shooting to the surface. Then this dump of ice would cause all these effects that we showed you talked about. And the earth, the canopy would collapse. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. We still have the scars today where the earth broke open. They're called the fault lines. And you can study earth science from this perspective, and it makes a whole lot more sense, I think. The hot water coming out from inside the crust of the earth would hit the regular water and kill critters like crazy. As the water came shooting out, it's going to lift up the basalt underneath as the continental plates slide back. As they slide back, it's going to cause what are called, it'll make what's called wrinkled mountains, folded mountains. In British Columbia, where I was yesterday, they have mountain ranges there that are obviously pushed from the end and it's wrinkled up. Wrinkled mountains like this have to be pushed from sideways. Um, this water came shooting out, probably would kill everything in the ocean within a few hundred miles of the cracks because hot water, when it hits regular water, kills the fishies. If you poured a gallon of boiling water into your aquarium, you would kill the fishies within a certain, certain radius, okay? And when hot water comes out, it does that. All over the world, diatomaceous earth is found, sometimes in huge collections like the one in Lompoc, California. Now, diatoms are really, really tiny, glass-bodied creatures. Under the microscope, they look gorgeous. There's some diatoms here. When they float around in the ocean, they die. When they sink to the bottom, then their kids die and sink to the bottom, and the grandkids die and sink to the bottom. And it takes about a thousand years to get one inch of diatoms. They are so tiny. You can take diatomaceous earth, you can buy it at the hardware store, 
and you can sprinkle around your house and it is so tiny insects get it stuck in the pores of their skin and it kills the insects. It's a good purely natural insecticide. It's real cheap. Diatomaceous earth is used in swimming pool filters, it's used in detergents, it's used in fertilizers, it's used for kitty litter. The oil dry is made of diatomaceous earth. Well, I went out to Lompoc, California when I was preaching out there. I went and visited the largest diatomaceous earth quarry in the world, I think. The diatomaceous earth is, five, is 1,500 feet thick. They dig it out with bulldozers and you know huge cranes. They're digging out this diatomaceous earth. I asked the guy, the foreman at the job there, I said, do you find anything unusual in this diatomaceous earth? He said, oh, we find millions, probably trillions of fossils. Here's a fish fossil in diatomaceous earth. These little herring are found by the billions. Actually, he gave me a chunk of diatomaceous earth from the, from the quarry. This is it right here. It's just like chalk, so if you handle it, it's going to break. It's real lightweight. This one little square foot here probably contains 40 to 60 fish fossils. Can you see the skeletons in there? Just in one square foot. He said it's this way everywhere. What happened? They were digging in the diatomaceous earth quarry in 1976, and they came across the skeleton of a whale. <clears throat> A baleen whale standing on end, the whale was 80 feet long. Now the layers of diatoms were also tilted, so it wasn't the, the height of the whale that becomes the problem, but the thickness of a whale, maybe 8 or 10 or 15 feet thick. Now if it takes a thousand years for an inch of diatoms to accumulate, how are you going to preserve an entire whale skeleton? You think the whale's going to lay at the bottom of the ocean for 50,000 years waiting to get preserved? No, I think something's going to go eat it, right? <laughs> Uh, the rapid accumulation of diatoms to me indicates there was a flood when hot water came shooting out and it just so happens Lompoc, California is right on the San Andreas fault line. I think that's one of the places where the earth cracked open, the water came out and it killed the diatoms within a few hundred miles and they snowed to the bottom. And the swirling waters would put them in big huge thick layers and they're digging them out today. And there's a big chunk of it right there. You can come see for yourself the diatomaceous earth. The chalk cliffs of Dover also, 300 feet thick of solid chalk. Actually, the Latin word cretia means chalk. So the Cretaceous age they talk about in the textbook comes from the age of chalk. That's all baloney. There wasn't a chalk age. There were layers of chalk formed during the flood. Thick layers of chalk, sometimes accumulating in little piles. And this calcite would get together and end up in huge piles like they have in the chalk cliffs of Dover over there, 300 feet thick. The Bible says in Genesis 7, the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the waters. In the open theory, during the first few months of the flood, dead animals would settle out. They would get buried. Swirling water would tend to make them go in little eddies or end up with fossil graveyards. Moving water, if you go along a river during flood stage, you'll see little eddies, you know, swirling, little mini, mini whirlpools. Stuff tends to accumulate in those. And then when it gets buried, you'd get, you know, piles of gravel, for instance, like they have in South Bend, Indiana. Huge gravel beds. Probably the whole Florida Peninsula is all basically sand. Maybe that was a big swirling eddy that deposited a giant sandbar, which we call Florida, and live on today. This would happen during a worldwide flood. Uh, many of the features of the earth, if you think of it from a flood perspective, can, uh, this is the best explanation to explain these things. Moving water automatically sorts particles by density. Heavier stuff drops out first. As the current slows down, different stuff drops out. We've got this thing on the table here. You can play with these things all day. You can buy them at the mall. Different colors of sand, when you flip it over, as the sand drops down, it automatically makes more layers. There's only two, two different colors of sand in there, black and white, two different densities. Why doesn't it just make all the dark stuff at the bottom or denser and all the light stuff at the top? And instead, it always makes multiple layers. During a flood, you get the same phenomena, not just denser at the bottom and lighter on top, you'd get them all mixed together. And it'll make many layers, you can watch it. We're talking about something else, you don't have to watch it. You can watch it all the time if you like, but anyway. These, <laughs> Multiple layering happens during a flood also. There are several phenomena that happen during ra with rapidly moving mud. Underwater landslides are called turbidity currents, and they can go incredibly fast. Back in 1929, the transatlantic cable was cut. They had an earthquake, and there was a mudslide underwater. There were several cables. They knew how far apart they were, and so when the one cable got snapped and the next cable got snapped, they knew the exact times when the cable was snapped, and they calculated the, water was going the mud was going 70 miles an hour underwater and covered 40,000 square miles, one underwater mudslide. 
Can you imagine during Noah's flood how many thousands of square miles of things would be covered by mudslides just from the water moving around? Swirling water would tend to put critters in, in big swirling eddies, and they would rot. While they're swirling around for three months, the head rots off, the ribs rot off, the tail rots off, the legs rot off, and you end up finding, like this picture shows, dinosaur bones in twisted, contorted positions. Here's a dinosaur backbone, no head, no ribs, no feet. Tangled up messes called fossil graveyards. There's a fossil graveyard discovered in 1934. Um, it, had, it said the concentration of fossils was like logs in a jam. Fossil graveyards are found all over the world. I mean, there are thousands of these. Huge piles of things died, or got buried at least, in one place. Doesn't tell us where they died, we just know where they ended up getting buried. Here's a picture showing four dinosaurs, or small hoofed mammals, I'm sorry, not dinosaurs, four of them in Nebraska that were found in the swimming position. They're all fossilized, but they were, they were swimming. Probably in water getting muddier and muddier, and they ended up getting buried, drowning in that position and covered and fossilized. It doesn't take long for things to fossilize. There's a place in Africa called the Karoo Formation. Estimates are there are 800,000 million, that's 800 billion vertebrate animals buried in this one big formation across Africa. What happened? Well, there was a flood. Back in 1878, they found uh, in, a grave, in a coal mine in Belgium, iguanodon skeletons running through 100 feet vertically of rock. All these iguanodon skeletons, at least 100 feet of rock deposited very quickly, obviously. Up in northern Canada, there's a, a place called Ellis Island. There on Ellis Isle, Ellesmere Island, there are no trees at all, none, yet they find petrified redwood stumps up there. There are certainly no redwood trees growing up there in northern Canada, okay? There are only a few select locations where they grow along the California coast and up into Oregon a little bit. And it doesn't take long for things to petrify, not at all. Things can petrify very quickly. We've got some examples here on the table of things that petrified very quickly. I'll show you those in a second. Here's a picture of a petrified water wheel. Here's a petrified firewood. It was chopped on before it got petrified. You can go to Southern Forest World Museum in Georgia, way across Georgia, there's a mummified dog stuck inside a tree. Some people say it's petrified. I don't know if it's mummified. I've not been there yet. But anyway, how can a dog get mummified just in a few, probably a few years? Chased a coon up the tree, got stuck. They named it Stucky, of course. That's the name for the dog. They had a contest to name it, so they called it Stucky. Uh, tree, they cut the tree down for firewood. There's a dog inside. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. The boot was made in the 1950s. Got his leg shot off or torn off or who knows what, but there's his leg petrified. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. A petrified hammer was found from a marine base, marine barracks from World War II. Petrified hammer. Petrified hat found in New Zealand. Here's a kid, right, a kid sent me this right here on the table. A petrified crayon found in Arizona. I mean, the crayon is turned to stone. We have right here a petrified pickle. It's in our museum. Well, it's here tonight, but a guy sent me the, this and the jar with it. The jar is still in our museum. Um, he said, Well, Hovind, I found this old house in Montana. The roof was gone. The house had been empty at least 30 years. But we were digging around through what's left of this house and found the pantry. And there were pickle jars in there, but the lid to one of the jars rusted, and the pickle inside turned to stone. Would you like it for your museum? I said, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> one kid wrote me a letter. Here's the letter right here. He said, Brother Hovind, I was eight years old doing a science experiment. I put a bunch of acorns in a bucket of water to see if they would sprout, and I forgot about them. A year later, my mom saw the bucket on the back porch. She said, get rid of that bucket and all that junk out there. He said, uh, the acorns had turned to stone in one year. I have right here a baggie of petrified acorns. <laughs> it doesn't take long, folks. Don't let them tell you it takes millions of years for things to petrify. It's not true. A guy sent me a picture of a petrified pin cushion. The pin cushion, you can see the pins had rusted off, except where the, you can see the rust marks where the pins had been stuck in there. Petrified pin cushion. They dug up a grave in uh, Tennessee several years ago. They found the body of the person inside the grave had petrified, turned to stone. The doctor died and they buried him. Fourteen years later, his wife died. This is back in 1881. They dug a hole to bury Grandma, and water went into the hole. And they thought, oh, we don't want to bury Grandma in the water, so they buried her someplace else. And then the kids got worried about Grandpa in that moving water. It hit an underground spring, apparently. So they dug up Grandpa. He'd been in the ground 14 years. And the article says, the occupant of the coffin had been turned to stone, presumably as a result of the uh, a continual flow of water. It said the arms had rotted off, but the rest of the body had turned to stone, petrified. A guy found a petrified man in Montana 
He took it five foot eight. The guy carried it around as a museum curiosity for years in carnivals and fairs and stuff. Petrified body of a man found on the beach in Montana, in a, a, a beach of a river. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, a lady went into the hospital. She said, my side's been hurting. The lady was 62 years old. They x-rayed her and found a petrified fetus, a baby, inside. She had been pregnant. The baby almost came to term and died, apparently, and turned to stone inside her body. 62-year-old lady with a petrified baby inside. Here's the article. You can read it for yourself. Um, I met a guy in Maryland who said he worked at a hospital, Brian Lackey, who lives in Washington, but uh, he, there's his phone number. He was in Maryland. He said they brought a lady in there and took out a petrified fetus out of her body. Uh, the baby's in, uh, in the museum now, or in, a, in a, a medical hospital up there. Petrified fetus. Here's petrified sacks of flour found in Arkansas. A flour mill flooded. The flour turned to stone. The sacks of flour were buried in, in water and mud and turned to rock. There's our petrified pickle right there. You can see the jar it was found in. Come by our museum at Dinosaur Adventureland and see all this. So it's true there are layers to the earth. It's also true they can form very quickly. I think the flood's the best explanation for this. Skeptics will say, wait a minute, why are all dinosaur bones found in the same layer? Uh, first of all, they're not, okay? But it is true there is a little bit of sorting to the fossils, okay? And I think there's a better explanation for that than evolution. They're only told in school this is showing an evolutionary pattern. This is pure baloney in my totally unbiased opinion. Um, first place, the fossils are not sorted clearly like the textbook says. David Ropp said, um, one of the ironies of the evolution-creation debate is the creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossil record shows a detailed and orderly progression. And they've gone to great lengths to accommodate this fact in their flood geology. There isn't an orderly progression. If there is any progression at all, there's a better explanation called the flood. I think fossils are separated uh, by their density, and we'll cover that in a minute. But th there is no geologic column. We covered that in video number four. Uh, they date the rocks by the fossils, date the fossils by the rocks. It's all based on circular reasoning. Moving water and liquefaction are much better explanations for the sorting in the fossil record. There are several things that happen with high velocity water in a flood moving around, swirling around the world. You get liquefaction, you get, of course, abrasion and, and uh, uh, simple erosion, and you get hydraulic plucking. Rapidly moving water creates a vacuum, and it sucks rocks right off the side. The big dam, the dam in uh, Arizona, the uh, Glen Canyon Dam in Arizona, they had water going through the uh, pipes uh, to let the, it was having flood season, getting rid of as much water as they could, and it started going too fast. And they, they saw it turn red as it came out the side. They said, oh, shut it down. It's eroding the sides of the dam. Within, I think, 20 seconds, it took from the to time that they got the message to shut the water down. Scuba divers went down there, and during that, I think, 20 seconds, it had eroded an area in the side of the mountain the size of a, football, the size of a basketball court about four feet th deep sucked it right off the side. Rapidly moving water <laughs> dissolves the, the, whatever it's moving against. Process called hydraulic plucking. There's another phenomenon called liquefaction. If you go stand out on the beach, walk out into the surf where the water's about knee deep, just stand there, don't move. Every time the waves come by, the high part of the wave is heavier than the low part. There's more water. The high part is going to press the sand down. As the low part comes past you, it's going to relieve the pressure. And if you're down there with goggles looking at it, you can see the sand hopping up off the bottom. Just stand there and don't move. Within about five minutes, you'll be about that deep, your feet covered up in sand. And you didn't move. What's happening is the pressing and relieving of the pressure is causing a phenomenon called liquefaction. This is automatically going to sort things. Now, during the flood, you would get enormous liquefaction because the, the, just the tides, as the earth turns under the moon, if the earth is covered with water, the tides are still going to work during the flood, but now there's no continents to stop them. Today, the tide just gets going, and then it bumps into something like South America. So, you know, all the energy is taken out. But during the flood, you wouldn't have that. Computer models tell us that if the earth were covered with water, smoothed out and covered with water, the tides would change 200 feet every six hours and 25 minutes. Well, today here in Florida, they change, you know, what, 16 inches. You know, we don't get much tide here. I was, I've been up to the Bay of Fundy in northern Canada where the tide changes up to 100 feet. is a record, 102 feet. Anchorage, Alaska has the second highest tide in North America. 30-foot tidal change. You can see the water come rushing up, and then six hours later start rushing back down. So you'd get a 200-foot tidal change during the flood. This 200 feet of water would do enormous things to the surface underneath called liquefaction. It would sort things. Actually, a guy took an aquarium, big aquarium one time, and he put a big hot water bottle in the bottom and poked it full of thousands of holes, and he hooked a hose up to it. 
Then he dumped into the aquarium dirt, rocks, gravel, sand, mud, dead fish, dead amphibians, dead reptiles. Mixed them all up in a cement mixer and dumped them in. Turned the hose on. Water came out through the bottom and bubbled up through this aquarium to fill up the aquarium. Of course, as it fills up the aquarium, it's going to lift the particles and then drop them again. And the denser ones drop a little faster every time. Within just a few hours of filling this aquarium, it sorted all the animals and it put the fish at the bottom, amphibians next, reptiles next, birds on top. Automatically sorted them. Now, it would look like they got buried in that order, but no, they got sorted in that order by liquefaction. Plus, if huge areas of sand are buried under there, if, sand, if something is lighter and it's buried by a heavier, denser uh, uh, layer on top, you can get what's called a sand plume. All of a sudden, things are moving around pretty soon, bloop, it bubbles to the top. And big chunks of lighter material like sand would bubble out to the top. That's probably what caused Ayers Rock in, Arizona, in uh, Australia. It's a giant sand plume badly eroded today. And you can see if you get up close to it, there are millions of little tiny holes in it. It's probably a big, what's called a sand plume, where the sand just bubbled up through the heavier material on top of it. Liquefaction also causes the ground to turn like jelly. During earthquakes, like here's these buildings in Japan, during the earthquake, the ground shakes, all the water comes to the top, and the buildings just sink in. If animals are sorted at all, it's probably based on habitat. Evolutionists would say, Hovind, don't you know clams are found at the bottom of the geologic column? I say, well, first, they're not always found at the bottom. But uh, if they are found at the bottom, generally, that's probably because that's where they live. Logic would tell us they'd be the first ones buried, right? Animals might be sorted based on habitat. They might be sorted based on intelligence. You know, as far as anybody can figure out, clams are not too smart. <laughs> they might be sorted based on mobility. Did you know clams can't run very fast? It might be sorted based on body density. Did you know clams are a little heavier than bird feathers? And birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. So if birds are found on top of the geologic column, that doesn't prove they evolved last. It proves they drowned last. <laughs> or they ended up floating to the top when they did drown. So the Bible says the high hills were covered. The earth was totally covered by a flood. 15 cubits, that's about 22 feet, over the mountains. Boy, God thinks of everything. That ark was 45 cubits, or 30 cubits high. Uh, 45 feet. So there was, if it had 50% underwater, which is pretty heavy for a boat, still couldn't scrape bottom on any mountains. They were perfectly safe in there. God thought of everything. So the skeptics say, where'd all the water go? Oh, it's still here. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the water's assuaged. That means to drop down, to sink down. Now living, or NIV says the wild animals, they weren't wild animals, they were tame. And it says the water's receded. That's not technically correct. They actually assuaged it, dropped down. If we filled this room four feet deep in water, and then all of a sudden the floor caved in over here and dropped down 10 feet, that's going to suck all the water from there into the hole. That's what happened in uh, Winter, Winter Garden, Florida, where the neighborhood fell in. Anybody see that? All of a sudden, about four houses and everything just dropped down about 30 feet. And boof. <laughs> Big sinkhole developed. I think it's Winter Garden, just somewhere like near Orlando. That happens occasionally around the world. Things just sink down. Well, during the flood, you'd get this sinking process as the ocean floors would drop out and the water would rush into those holes. The Bible says the water stood above the mountains. So I think during the first few months of the flood, the animals sorted out and got fossils were forming. During the last part of the flood, the plates of the earth are still shifting and they're unstable and they began to lift up or sink down different places. Thin spots sink down, other places lift up, forming uh, mountain ranges. Water rushes off, forming erosion in a hurry. The Bible says in Psalm 104, At thy rebuke, they fled. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. Talking about the water. It says they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. Now many reference Bibles have a footnote right here, because this is an old English phrase. What this is saying is the mountains arose, the valleys sank down. During the last part of the flood, the mountains actually lifted up. So was Mount Everest underwater? Mount Everest wasn't there. It formed during the last part of the flood as the mountains lifted up. So that area was underwater. That's how you explain the clams on top. But Mount Everest technically wasn't there until after the flood or during the flood it formed. The ocean crust is thinner than continental crust. They know this from earthquakes, you know, checking the S&P waves with uh, kind of like doing a sonogram of the earth. They do that all the time. Uh, thinner spots would tend to sink down. Water's going to rush in, filling in these places, causing oceans. The crust of the earth is about 30 miles thick under the continents and about 3 miles thick 
three to five miles thick under the oceans. And the Earth all busted up into plates like that. And some are still moving. This map shows the earthquake potential of different areas. Pensacola has just about zero chance of getting an earthquake. Now we have a chance of getting other problems, you know, like uh, natural disasters, like maybe you know, hurricanes or tornadoes or politicians. But uh, those, uh, not much chance of an earthquake here. I think the Earth crust compared to the Earth is pretty thin. 30 miles compared to 8,000 is almost nothing. Kind of like a waterbed, you know, if you push down one place, someplace else lifts up. So as the Earth settled out after the flood, you would get continents forming. Mountains arose, valleys sank down, water rushed off, e erosion was incredible. These pictures show the uh, Canyon Lake uh, Dam flood in New Braunfels, Texas, uh, just in 2002. The water went over the top of the spillway from the flood water, and boy, it carved out canyons, washed out roadbeds in a real big hurry. Anybody who's been near a bad flood knows it doesn't take long for erosion to take place. And if you look out over the world, you can see erosion marks all over the place. I fly out west, and you look out the window, and you can see huge erosion patterns in places that never rain. Here's a slick rock in Arizona. Obviously, erosion did that. To me, the flood's the best explanation. When I flew from uh, two days, three days ago from uh, Spokane, Washington, over to Seattle, Washington, you can fly over and see the Channel Scablands. It's unbelievable. There's the Dry Falls, uh, Washington, out there. Largest waterfall in the world with no water going over it. That's left over from either an ice dam breaking, causing the Channel Scablands, or from the flood. This uh, shows what's called the Three Gossips, the uh, rocks formation standing up with John Wayne riding around there someplace. The textbooks are going to say it takes millions of years to form these things. And you can see the, the, the buttes and the elevated plateaus, you know, obviously erosion. You can go see Bryce Canyon, beautiful. I mean, it's basically wasted real estate, but it's, you know, beautiful looking anyway. They say it takes millions of years to do that. Here's a close-up view of the same type of thing. You can see the little spear, uh, spear, spire sticking up in the ground, off the ground. They say it takes millions of years. Oh, there's my ink pen on top. I don't think so. This is a pile of dirt we had in the backyard. After one rainstorm, I went out and took a picture of it. Made what looked like exactly like Bryce Canyon <laughs> after one rainstorm. There's millions of years of erosion along a highway built a few months ago. Unprotected soil erodes quickly. This evidence of a giant lake and millions of years of erosion right here. You can see the obvious took millions of years to form that, boys and girls. Oh, there's my glasses. Another close-up pile of that pile of dirt. <laughs> close-up of that pile of dirt. It doesn't take long. You can go out to Montana and see these erosion features that are just enormous. I fly out west quite often. Get to look, I just look out the airplane and see, look out the window and see, man, there was a flood. But see, God doesn't want people to look at the erosion of the world and think flood. He wants them to look at the erosion and think millions of years because he doesn't want them to come to Christ. There's some pictures of Dry Falls, uh, Washington. Largest waterfall in the world, no water going over it. Just incredible erosion features. You can study that for yourself if you get time to look more into that. Talk about the water was 300 feet deep going over that waterfall. Niagara Falls is about four feet deep, the water going over. 300 feet deep water going over a waterfall. There's an eastern Montana uh, washout. It's interesting, most of the mountain ranges in the world follow the ocean basins. I think Walt Brown's theory is right on track, that the mountains arose, the valley sank down, the wrinkling of the pressing of the uh, plates as they're sliding would cause all this. To me, that's the, by far the best explanation of all this. Bent rock layers, as you see in these pictures here, see, rocks don't bend very well. Bent rock layers, to me, indicate they were bent while they were soft. During the flood, you'd get thousands of feet of mud, and then during the end of the flood, you get the, mount, the crust of the earth twisting and contorting, and then they slowly harden and turn to rock. I was in uh, Crystal, uh, Cove, Crystal Cove State Park in Los Angeles, California, a couple years ago. <coughs> you can see the close-ups here of these bent rock layers. We got up and looked at them real close, like with a magnifying glass. There are no cracks in these rocks. These were bent while they were all very soft layers. If they were bent after they were hard, they would fracture. They're not fractured. These were all formed quickly and all bent while they were still soft, and then they hardened into rock. As the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, the pressure would cause metamorphic rock, like marble, uh, they like to make tombstones out of. That's a result of the uh, twisting of the, of the crust of the earth. Skeptics say, how did the kangaroos get to Australia then? I mean, if the, after the flood, Noah got off the ark, all the craters got off, but how did the kangaroos end up in Australia? Australia is surrounded by water. Kangaroos can't swim very well, they'll say. When Noah got off the ark, 
the continents were actually larger than they are today. Now, this is going to sound strange, but let me explain. The oceans were smaller because there was still a bunch of ice at the North and South Pole. If you froze a few zillions of gallons of water and stuck them on the North and South Pole, that's going to lower the ocean level. This map shows England would not be an island if the water was a little bit lower. You know the deepest point of the English Channel is 150 feet? That's twice the width of this room. That's the deepest point. 30 miles wide, 150 feet deep. Do that on a graph paper to scale. It's a straight line. Um, the, you could actually walk out to Ireland and to Iceland right after the flood. You can see on this uh, satellite view showing the sunset coming into England, you can see the, the continental shelf. The water's not deep. As you fly into Pensacola, you can see the water's not very deep out there, folks, for quite a ways out. Between Alaska and Russia, the water's only like 60 feet deep, the width of this room. All you'd have to do is lower the water just a little bit and everything's connected. So I think right after the flood, the oceans were smaller because the continents were bigger because the water was trapped in the form of ice at the North and South Pole. If the oceans were just 10% deeper, this would be the beach right here. <coughs> the world is basically pretty smooth, pretty flat. When I flew into Galveston, Texas, you get off at the airport and say, Welcome to Galveston, elevation 7. I thought, man, one good wave and we're underwater here, you know, <laughs> 7 feet above sea level. Not much. Florida used to be gigantic after the flood. Probably the continental shelf is where the beach used to be. You could actually walk to Cuba, jump over to Creek. It could be the Gulf of Mexico filled in a few hundred years after the flood, and water came pouring in as the Atlantic filled up. It would pour in and fill in the Gulf of Mexico, carving out the grooves around Cuba. That could have happened after the flood. To me, it's a logical explanation. Mobile Bay, Pensacola Bay, generally less than seven feet deep. Sometimes when hurricanes come and the air is swirling the right way, it'll dry up both bays. They just, the water sucks right out. Between Australia and Vietnam, the water's only 30, 40, 50 feet deep. Not much. So if you lowered the ocean level by freezing you know, larger ice caps, you're going to get huge continental shelves connecting everything. So kangaroos, wombats, koalas, all these less aggressive animals getting off the ark, they, they're less aggressive and they would tend to rather run than fight. So as they move out, they settle in and make a house, you know, and then the tiger moves in. Kangaroo says, we're moving, guys. We're not going to stay by the tiger. And so they would tend to continually be at the, at the front edge, at the fringe of the migration wave. It would probably take a few hundred years, you know, to, for animals to spread out around the world. And they would continually give up their territory to the more aggressive animals. And when they get to Australia, they run out of places to go. But by now the water's coming up, and pretty soon Australia is isolated. So the reason we find kangaroos in Australia is because they were at the leading edge of the migration wave, running from the predators, and then they got trapped with no enemies. Hey, big island, it's all to ourselves, guys. Let's go have some kids and grandkids. And then they're covered up, you know, with kangaroos over there. So it's not because that's, that's where they evolved, it's because the flood's a good explanation for that. Uh, kangaroo fossils are found other places, but they didn't survive in those regions. They had too many predators. So why do we have a continental shelf? I think the ice caps melting back explains the continental shelf, explains why the oceans are wider and deeper and colder from the ice melting back, absorbing the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Next session, we'll finish up a little bit more on the Hovind theory and then tell you the importance of all this. This flood is powerful evidence of God's judgment on sin. And if you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, you're going to be judged in front of God for yourself, what you've done, what you've done in, in your flesh and in your body. Uh, you'll be judged without Christ. Man, I wouldn't want that. I'm going to stand there with Christ's righteousness on me. Say, Lord, you better let me into heaven because Jesus forgave my sin. I'll cover more on that in the next session. Well, welcome to our final section of seminar part six on the Hovind theory of what caused the flood in the days of Noah and where'd all the water go? And why did God flood the world? If you look at this map here, you can see Minneapolis is about 600 feet higher than New Orleans in elevation, 670 feet higher. But Minneapolis is a long ways from New Orleans. Actually, it's 1,150 miles from Minneapolis to New Orleans, which means the Mississippi River, which starts, starts near Minneapolis, has to flow 1,150 miles, but only drops 670 feet. You can calculate that out. That's a drop of about seven inches per mile. It has to run a full mile to drop that far. The Mississippi River is what's called a low gradient stream. It's just barely on sloped ground. 
Now, if you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would fill in behind it. If you built a dam across you know, the lower United States, you cover a whole chunk of America. Uh, all the Great Plains would be covered. But a large dam across Grand Canyon would fill in a huge lake, and Grand Canyon had to form quickly, as we can see from the evidence. The textbooks tell us Colorado River, over millions of years, formed the Grand Canyon. That is simply not true. We cover this in great detail on videotape number four of our series. Grand Canyon could not have been formed by the Colorado River. The top of Grand Canyon is higher than both ends. The river enters the canyon at 3,200 foot elevation. The top of the canyon is about seven or 8,000 feet elevation. Rivers don't flow uphill. That canyon was not formed by that river. That river just flows through that canyon, and canyons all over the world are like that. Grand Canyon is kind of puzzling because it loops back and forth, but it also has steep sides. Now, a looping river, meandering they call it, is typical of a low gradient stream. It's just not moving very fast normally. Steep sides indicates a high gradient stream, like the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon, where the, and between Oregon and Washington, where the river's flowing real fast down real steep ground and it cuts a big, deep gorge. Grand Canyon has both steep sides and loops or meanders. One explanation is this, of this is the river didn't do it. Flood water did that as it was rushing through there after, um, after Noah got off the ark. One catastrophe can rearrange the real estate in a hurry. When I preached up in Alaska, I went to see the Carnegie, Carnegie area, I think Trinigan Arms, I think they call it, where the big Alaskan earthquake dropped the ground down, you know, 30 to 60 feet just in a few seconds. Just <laughs> grounds, earth, the point is disasters can rapidly change the real estate. And Noah's flood was quite the disaster. Mount St. Helens was an example of a small disaster. My sister lives right near there. I just flew over Mount St. Helens yesterday. Um, Mount St. Helens went into Europe in 1980. The mud, it started blowing out the top, but right away the north slope blew out and all this dirt and mud and ash went sliding down the countryside about 100 miles an hour. As the mud went sliding down and the dirt went sliding down, it melted the ice caps on top, some of it blew big chunks of ice off in other places. But this released the volcano and steam and ash came shooting out and it covered huge areas of Washington state from this ash. You can see the ash clouds here in these pictures as it's flying out over the countryside. Uh, people were killed, about 60 people killed by this little, which was considered a small volcano. Here's a car covered up in ash. Uh, was buried by this really boiling hot ash cloud as it came over. They found uh, people all over dead in there. 60 some people died. You can see in the photograph here how that the ash went all the way out to cover part of South Dakota with ash from Mount St. Helens. Most of it concentrated over toward uh, Spokane. But Mount St. Helens is considered a tiny volcano by volcano standards. Compared to Krakatoa, it's Mount St. Helens was nothing. But even still, Mount St. Helens taught us some amazing lessons. For instance, the mud that flowed down sorted things into layers automatically. As this hot mud went flying down the countryside, it covered up and blocked off the Toodle River Valley. You can see in these pictures here, the mud flows that flowed down. Here's a semi covered up with mud, got caught in the mud flow from Mount St. Helens. This was hot mud coming out of there. Mount St. Helens, Helens blew enough material out for everyone on earth to have a ton it would fill a 10 cubic yard dump truck every second, 24 hours a day for 600 years. Lloyd Anderson lives up near there and has a creation ministry speaking on creation, takes people on tours of the Mount St. Helens area. If you ever get up to Washington, be sure to look up Lloyd Anderson or see uh, uh, creationism.org. It's not his website, but there's a lot of stuff on Mount St. Helens on that website. This mud flowed down into the valley, blocked off the river. It also covered up hot, big chunks of ice that had been blown off the volcano. Chunks of ice as big as a you know, living room uh, were blown off the volcano and landed and hot mud went over the top. Well, a few days later, the hot mud on the, on the cold ice made the ice melt, turned to steam. Steam expands 1,700 times and <coughs> blew out steam erosion pits. Here you can see the steam erosion pits with erosion marks along the side. Some professor is going to bring his kids here 100 years from now and say, boys and girls, this erosion took millions of years. Uh, no teacher, this took about 15 seconds. The big river system that formed about a year later after Mount St. Helens blew is talked about right here. It says, the landslide of Mount May 18th buried the river and highway to Spirit Lake to an average depth of 100 feet. It also buried most other drainages in the 23 square miles of the upper Toodle Valley and plugged the valley's mouth. For 22 months, the water had no established path to the lower waterway. Then on March 19th, 1982, an eruption melted an ice pack that had accumulated in the crater. The waters mixed with loose material on the slopes of the mountains, creating an enormous mud flow. In nine hours, while no one watched overnight, the mud flow carved an integrated system of drainages over much of the valley and reopened the way to the Pacific. 
The drainages included at least three canyons 100 feet deep. One was nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon of the Tootle because it's a 140th scale model of the real Grand Canyon. See, the mud flowed across, stopped the river from flowing, lakes backed up behind it. Once they got going over the top, it cut through the relatively soft mud, just 22 months old, hadn't completely turned to stone yet, cut through that stuff like a knife through butter. It carved it out. Canyons eroded quickly. Here you can see a picture of the canyon, a thousand feet wide, 140 feet deep, carved in nine hours, probably less than nine hours. You know, you go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning, it's there. At the bottom of that canyon is a little tiny river flowing through there called the Tootle River. I would call it a creek, but they call it a river over there. Once water starts going over a dam, <laughs> erosion can take place very quickly. Any farmer can tell you that if he's ever built a dam to water his cows and the water went over the top of the, you know, overflowed the dam, it washed out. We have a demo we do at, Grand, at our Dinosaur Adventure Land that shows the same thing, how water can erode quickly. This is the Little Grand Canyon picture here from Lumpkin, Georgia, near Columbus. They built a house up there, built a shed, I think is how it started, and the guy didn't put gutters on, and water came running off the shed and started eroding this little hillside back in the 1800s. Now it's a huge state park with acres and acres and acres of erosion that all started just in the last 200 years. Well, Mount St. Helens has the same thing. There are canyons there, miniature Grand Canyons that formed just in a few hours. Here's some people standing on top of the cliff looking down into this canyon. If you go down in, you can see the sides of it have layers. It's stratified into layers. This had to form very quickly. All the mud washed in there at one time. The canyon was carved out at one time. It does not take a long time for this to happen. Here you can see the very fine strata here of these layers. You can get the same thing with a jar of dirt and water. You shake it up and set it down and it settles into layers in a hurry. It doesn't take long. And at the bottom of this Grand Canyon near where the Tootle River goes, there's a little river called the Tootle River. And if you think that little river made that canyon, you're mistaken. And if you think the Colorado River made Grand Canyon, you're just as mistaken. It had to form quickly as the flood water ran off. So when the textbook says millions of years, they're confused or they're lying. Now, Mount St. Helens also blew a lot of trees down. About 150 square miles was flattened. I mean, millions of trees were blown down. And they went in to haul out these trees to salvage what they could. Trees floated down the rivers. Here you can see some semi-trucks, you know, buried in these massive logs out there. And if you've never seen the trees in Washington and Oregon, you don't know what a real tree is. I mean, they get huge out there out west. They hauled out as many trees as they could. I mean, millions of trees were hauled out to use for firewood and for, I mean, for lumber. But many of the trees were blown into Spirit Lake, which is just on the north side of the volcano. These trees, you can see them in the picture, floating across the lake. 2,000 acres, about three square miles of trees floating on Spirit Lake. They're still there today, many of them. Now, thousands of them have gotten waterlogged and sunk to the bottom. But generally, they would sink root end first. Not always, but they would sink root end first, and they would sink by species. I mean, the Douglas fir would sink one year. The pines would sink a different year. The species separation was interesting because as they sink, as they sink, then new layers of mud wash in on top, and it's going to look like the forest grew down there at the bottom. None of them grew there. These were rafted in and dropped off as they got waterlogged and sank. Here you can see an upright floater floating in the upright position. Scientists estimate there are 20,000 trees stuck in the bottom of the mud at Spirit Lake right now. None of them grew there, and they're already over 15 feet deep in sediments from subsequent things washing in around the, uh, off the shore. Well, during Noah's flood, you would get trees by the bazillions covered up, some in the standing position, and they would get sediments forming around them very rapidly. All over the world, petrified trees are found in the vertical position, petrified standing up. We cover much more on that on videotape number four, about the petrified trees in the vertical position. And if a, if a tree petrifies standing up, and then later the dirt washes away from it, the petrified tree is going to fall over, and it's going to break up into logs. I don't know if you ever cut a tree down for firewood or not, but when you cut a tree down, it does not break up into logs for you automatically. You got to saw it up with your chainsaw. Well, yet, in, if you look at the petrified forests in Calistoga, California, or Flora, Mississippi, or all over Arizona, or central Texas, you find, find these petrified logs broken up as if it petrified standing and then fell over. I think the flood's the only way to explain that. Well, scuba divers went in under these log mats in Mount St. Helens in Spirit Lake, and they could see the logs are bouncing back and forth against each other, and it rolled all the bark off very quickly. All this bark settled to the bottom, made a thick layer of bark at the bottom, about three feet thick. That's going to turn to coal under the right conditions. Textbooks say it takes millions of years to coal to form. No, it doesn't either. Coal can be formed in a few hours in the laboratory. It doesn't take long. 
You get the right temperature, the right pressure, you can turn organic material into coal in a hurry. This picture shows a floating log mat model from uh, Stephen Austin at ICR. I recommend his work tremendously, uh, uh, incredibly well done stuff on the coal formation. He thinks during the flood, and I agree, there were huge log mats floating back and forth across the ocean. You'd get acres and acres of trees uprooted, floating back and forth, and as they float along, they drop off and leave a debris trail. As they float across, then pretty soon mud washes in, then they float back a few weeks later, and another layer of coal is going to form on top. The layers of coal that we see in the world are indication of a flood. Oftentimes, they d dig down, hit a layer of coal, dig down some more, hit rock, and then dig down some more, and hit more coal. I was just in West Virginia a couple weeks ago, and you can fly over West Virginia and see the, the coal mines that they have. Layer after layer of coal. They dig down, hit the coal, dig down a little more, hit dirt, and then more coal. Multiple layering is best explained by the flood. Now, I debated Jeannie Scott in, uh, from Berserkley, California, and she said there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at all the coal in the world, all the plants of the world today would not form that much fossil fuel. She's right. In other words, there's more coal in the ground now than there are trees to produce it. Here's a big chunk of coal from our museum. There is so much coal in the ground, if you took every bush and plant and tree and blade of grass in the world, you could not form all the coal that's found in the ground. She's right. There is an enormous amount of coal down there. Where'd it come from? She said, it took millions of years to form all this coal. No, Janie, it took a big flood. And you've got to con consider that the world before the flood was different. It was mostly covered with land and plants. The Bible says there were plants over the whole earth. Today, the earth is 70% underwater. Only 3% of the earth is habitable for mankind. So she's looking at the world today, assuming that's how it's always been. Now, the Bible warned us about those scoffers that would say, you know, the way things are happening today is the way they've always been, 2 Peter chapter 3. But she's wrong about it taking millions of years to form the coal. It took one big flood and a very different world to get flooded. The pre-flood world was a lot different. There's a coal mine in Montana, 10,000 square miles of coal up to 200 feet thick. Sometimes in the ceiling of the coal mines, they find dinosaur tracks, hundreds of them. How do you explain this? Well, during the flood, you'd get log mats laid down and the dinosaurs are walking on top of it. And then later they drown. Another layer of mud washes in and fills in their footprints. And as they dig out the coal, they discover the footprint stuck in the ceiling. They were walking around in the uh, floating, in the in a debris trail left behind by this um, stuff. Here's a bunch of tracks. You can see the picture here. These are all footprints in the ceiling of coal mines. In central Alabama, there's a large coal mine. They find petrified trees standing up. A friend of mine works up there in the mine. He said oftentimes they find layers of coal that are separated, and pretty soon they come together. It's called lensing. Now, they're telling us that these coal layers are different ages. It's just simply not true. The coal layers and the mud layers all form simultaneously, just like with this thing. You can flip it around back and forth, and you can see little lenses form in here. Sometimes they are layers of rock, uh, layers of dark in between layers of white, and the white comes together. Um, the um, formations in Wyoming, uh, oftentimes the textbooks say it took millions of years to form the Green River Formation. When they dig down through the Green River Formation, they find different numbers of layers between different areas. We cover all that in video number seven. It did not take a long time to form that. It took a big flood. Now, sometimes in coal, human artifacts are found, like this bell found inside a lump of coal in West Virginia, or this zinc and silver vessel found in solid rock in Massachusetts. The textbook says this is, you know, 600 million year old rock. No, it's not. In 1891, they found a gold chain inside a lump of coal back in Illinois. A carved stone was found inside a lump of coal in Iowa. Here's an iron pot. There's a model of it right here on the table. This is a casting of the iron pot found inside a lump of coal in Oklahoma. The real one's in Carl Baugh's museum in Glen Rose, Texas. The sole of a shoe was found inside a lump of coal. There's an article about it right here. And they said the rock was 213 million years old. Now, a coal formed during that flood in the days of Noah. The Bible says in Genesis 8, the waters assuaged. They dropped down. They sank down. And then it says the water was going and returning. It returned from off the earth continually. The Hebrew phrase here in Genesis 8 is the going and returning, halak vashub. The water was going and returning. Well, if you get sections of the earth that sink down, the water's going to rush in and then slosh back and forth, probably for weeks, as the energy gets dissipated. This is the best way to explain the horizontal bedding planes that we see, <coughs> the mud layers settling out flat, and then folding up as the mountains arose and the valleys sank down, and then getting washed off by subsequent erosion, and then new layers being put on top.
These places are called unconformities in geology. The bottom of Grand Canyon has a huge one. I think the flood's the best explanation for all this, not millions of years of slow, gradual accumulation. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. Now, Noah didn't get out till the thirteenth month. If you read through Genesis, you'll see God told him to go in the ark, told him when to go out of the ark. It was, he was in there for over 12, about twelve and a half months. But it rested in the seventh month. Why would he stay in there the extra five and a half months after the ark hit bottom? If Noah's ark is indeed 18, 17 miles from the main Mount Ararat, then we have a piece of it. This may be a piece of, this is a piece of the formation uh, that Ron Wyatt thinks is Noah's ark. So that might be a piece of the ark, I don't know. But why would he stay in there for all that extra time? Why not get out? Well, for one reason, uh, the ark, water was still going back and forth. It wasn't safe to get out yet. Maybe that's why some of the anchor stones are found several miles from where the ark is. They might have cut the ropes loose and then another wave comes back, lifts them up and moves them in on a few miles, sets them down again. So there may be a reason for the separation there. Plus, the ground is still muddy outside and there's nothing to eat outside and nothing to build with. It would take a while for things to grow again. Seeds that float around in the flood would tend to re-germinate and start to grow afterwards and you end up five months later. Now it's time to get out. There's stuff to eat outside. The Bible says in the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So here's the Hovind theory. Over the next few years, 100 years actually, the ice cap slowly melted back. This makes the oceans larger, the continents smaller. It gives us a continental shelf, and cold water stores carbon dioxide. Hot water won't store it. That's why when your soda pop gets warm, it loses its fizz. If the water oceans are getting colder, they're going to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, and that's what plants used. That's one of the greenhouse gases, and that's going to allow more radiation to get in. As the CO2 is absorbed, now more radiation gets in and shortens lifespans in the days of Peleg. As the ice caps melt, the people are spreading out around the world and they end up getting trapped. You got a couple hundred years to spread from the Tower of Babel to spread all over the world. In a few hundred years, they could walk anywhere. And then they ended up getting trapped as the mountains, as the ice caps melted back and the oceans filled in. There's a good book about the spreading of the populations after the flood called. Uh, Noah to Abram, the turbulent years, you can order that through our bookstore. So my explanation is, the Hovind theory is, the ice caps were smaller, they melted back, leaving behind the drumlins, the terminal moraines, and all the ice age effects that we see today. And by the time you get to the days of Peleg, 200 years later, most of this is done. Ice caps, people are divided. The earth is divided. The Bible says in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Now there are several theories what that means. One theory says the languages and nations were divided in the days of Peleg. The Tower of Babel incident took place. We don't know the date for that, but it, because it was a different one of Noah's sons that the genealogies figured through. Second theory says the continents moved. I don't buy that one, because if you move a continent, you know, 20 feet, you're going to kill everybody just from the earthquakes it's going to generate. Some people think the water came up and divided the continents. I think that's a logical theory. As the ice melts back, the water comes up, and things that used to be hills and valleys are now islands, and they're separated. Third, fourth theory is the land was surveyed. A few hundred years after the flood, they'd have so many people by now, they're going to start arguing and say, hey, wait a minute, that's my property. Let's draw a line right here. Let's divide the land, and we'll put a few markers out here, and you know, we'll, this is my yard, that's your yard. Divide it up. Eventually, that's going to have to happen. I don't know. But the ice caps melting back explains a lot of things. The continental shelf, the colder oceans, and the shortened lifespans. As the Atlantic Ocean filled in after the flood, from the ice caps melting back, it would get deeper. Pretty soon, it starts to spill over right by Spain. And it would carve out the uh, straits that we see there. As the water filled in, it would fill in part of the Mediterranean. The western Mediterranean was filled in probably 100 years after the flood. Then it got deeper and it spilled over by Sicily and filled in the eastern Mediterranean. They're finding underwater in, along the coast of Egypt and several other places in the world, they're finding cities that are underwater. Why would somebody build a city underwater? Well, they didn't build it underwater. They built the city and then the water came up, probably a few hundred years after the flood from the melting ice caps. Then it finally spilled backwards into the Black Sea. There were big articles in the paper a couple years ago about they discovered Noah's flood because they found cities 150 feet underwater in the Black Sea. <laughs> That's not Noah's flood. It's probably from a result of Noah's flood. But these cities under 150, 100, under 150 feet of water are probably from post-flood times. They built too close to the beach, water came in, they had to abandon their cities. So. The flood effects are still here today to show us God hates sin. Every time you look at coal, oil, fossil rocks, even gasoline, it ought to remind you of God's judgment on sin. God hates sin. 
Let me leave you with one thought here. This is a picture of a guy named Harry Truman. Harry Truman lived right on the side of Mount St. Helens. A friend of mine, Tim Barron's, I'm on every Wednesday morning on the Tim and Al show in St. Louis by radio. Uh, Tim Barron's witness to Harry. He said, Harry was a very profane man. He listened carefully and rejected what I had to say. He didn't want to accept Jesus. Harry lived right on the side of Mount St. Helens. The government officials came in and said, Harry, this mountain is going to blow up. You need to move. He said, I'm staying right here. He stayed right there. He's still there someplace. Nobody ever found him after the volcano blew up. Probably under 50 feet of ash right now. Isn't that dumb to hear, hey, your, your mountain's about to blow up. You really need to move. Get ready for it. And to not heed a warning like that, that's what Harry did. I wonder how many of you have had the warning, this world's going to be destroyed. God hates sin. He's going to judge sin. Get ready for it. Get saved. Get in Christ. That's the only safe way out. You've heard that and you haven't done it. <laughs> Why not? The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, if you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, why not? The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter chapter 3. He wants everybody to come to repentance. He cannot let you into heaven, though, with your sin. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. I'm going to heaven because I'm forgiven. And you can have the same thing. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, you ought to. The Bible says in Matthew, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that was before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to all stand there. We're going to be judged. And God's going to look at me and say, all I see is Jesus. Come on in. Because I got Jesus' righteousness put onto my account. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good, and neither are you. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, why not? Why don't you ask Him to be your Savior now? It's so simple. Thirty-five years ago, a friend of mine said, Kent, are you going to heaven? I said, oh, I don't know. I've been baptized and catechized and pasteurized and homogenized and simonized. You know, what else is there? He said, if you died today, where would you go? I said, I'd go to hell. He said, is that what you want? I said, no, nope, but I don't know what to do about it. He showed me from the Bible I was a sinner. I knew that. He showed me I deserved to go to hell. I knew that. He showed me the Bible says Jesus died for me. And all he's waiting on is an invitation to come in my heart and save me and forgive me. So February 9, 1969, I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? He did. That's getting born into God's family. Birth only takes a few minutes. Growth takes a long time. Birth, just a short process. You can get born into God's family right now. Just pray and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me and save me right now? He'll do it. And you need to write today's date down as your spiritual birthday. And then you need to grow. Now, growth takes a long time. Growth involves reading your Bible, praying, getting baptized, going to church, studying what the Scriptures say, trying to obey God's Word. Let Him have control of your life. Let Him be the Lord of your life. That's the growth part. Hey, if we can be any help, please feel free to call us. Our ministry exists to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. There are quite a few questions left hanging, like what about carbon dating? What about uh, uh, the races? Where do the races come from? We'll cover all that on video number seven. Hope this has been a blessing to you folks. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. 
And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, If you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all.